SDF board member, Jack Brewer. Glory to God. It's amazing. Glory to God. God is good, right? Oh, excuse me. I'm going to take these glasses off because the lights are shining. Um, I don't have a speech prepared tonight because I'm calling on the Holy Spirit to just put words in my mouth. Glory to God. Love you, man. BCF. I never considered myself a conservative growing up in Texas. Family full of Democrats who've always told me and taught me the same old things. But something happened to me in 2015 when some person came down this es escalator and started to change a lot of our minds. Amen. God had his hand on him. And I saw it. And I realized that today we have a calling on our lives. I don't care what color you are, but the black conservative has a calling on our lives. Our kids, I just came straight from a prison. That's why I don't have on a tuxedo, because I got some clean tuxes, I tell you that. I didn't have time to put it on. I came straight from the panhandle of Florida, talking to a bunch of men in prison. And the problem is, amen, the problem is, is most of the men look just like me. And the problem even that's even bigger is the fact that most of those men never had a daddy in their lives. And now we sit in a country with 18.6 million fatherless kids. And we're talking about Republican and Democrat and Independent. No! We need conservative values put back in our homes, back in our schools, and back in this society. And it's not going to wait. It's not waiting for anybody. Our kids are hurting. They shooting each other. I was a captain on three NFL teams. God bless me. I led men. I've led men all my life. I watched the Super Bowl this year and I see a parade where there's kids shooting at each other and killing people at a parade in the greatest country on earth. We have a crisis on our hands. These kids have no guidance. The Ten Commandments is non-existent. That's why I walk around with my Bible. Because I want people to see me with this. It's the only way. And that is what BCF stands for. Rallying the black conservative, reminding the black father that we have an obligation, not just for the kids that we create, but the kids in our communities that we need to inspire so they can grow up to dream to be like Byron Donalds. So they can dream to be like Ben Carson and go do brain surgeries on people. The black conservatives are the leaders of this nation and we have to speak louder and we have to be specific, but we can't just keep talking about the problems. We've got to be willing to pay the price for the solutions. Are we going to go into prisons and jails? Are we going to pass policies on prisons and jails and never go inside? Are we going to go into the inner city schools? Or are we going to be the pundits and just talk about the issues with reading and math proficiency levels? What are we going to do? Are we going to spend our money for organizations like BCF? Are we, are we going to keep having the underfunded black organizations? I just heard that someone's going to match every dollar raised tonight. Every dollar raised. And I give a lot of my own money to men and women all over the world. We feed about 5,000 kids a day. <laughs> Glory to God.
But today I'm giving $5,000 right now to BCF. I know it's being matched. And I'm calling on each and every one of you to do the same. I paid for my own flight. I ain't getting paid to speak. Y'all with me? Before I leave, I'm gonna, oh, if you go up, just bow your heads. I got to pray real quick because God's telling me to do it. Father God, I know there's already been prayer in this house, and I call upon you right now to put it on the hearts of the people, Father God, so that they put their treasure, Father God, behind organizations like this, Father. But I ask that you put a spirit of service in this place, Father God. Inspire us, Father God. Motivate us, Father God. Your word said that you did not come here to be served but to serve. And to give your life as a ransom to many. Father God, put the servant heart into the men and women in here, Father God. May the black men in here stand and rise up to fight this crisis that's before us, Father. The last word of the Old Testament says, he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the hearts of the children to the fathers. Lest I smite the earth with a curse, Father God. We see that curse, we feel that curse, Father God, and as black conservative, we will stand today affirmed and in agreement that we will fight against it, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the Vice President of the Black Conservative Federation, Quentin Jordan. in South Carolina. I don't know who picked that song as my intro, but that's going to be hard to follow up. <laughs> we couldn't have asked for a more beautiful crowd than what we have here with us tonight. For us to be in Columbia for the first time and receive this amount of support is truly an incredible feeling. So on behalf of everybody at the Black Conservative Federation, I want to give you all a round of applause. When we first started this journey to expand conservative principles across America, specifically in black communities, not only were we told that movements and rooms like this didn't exist, but we were told that they couldn't exist. The main thing that we heard was, well, we've tried. We've gone into the communities and we've talked to people about politics and they just don't want to hear it. My response was, well, good. Luckily, we didn't plan to go and talk to people about politics. See, our approach is a little different. When we show up in communities and we meet people where they're at, we don't go and talk about politics. We talk about topics that people actually care about. Here's a little cheat code for you. I like to call it the four Fs. Family, faith, freedom, and finances. Now. I'm pretty confident that I can have a conversation with almost anybody on the planet on at least one of those topics. And if you find yourself in a situation where you can't have a conversation with somebody on one of those topics, well, quite frankly, it's not the message that they don't want to hear. It's the messenger that they don't care to hear it from. And that's where our organization thrives. See, the reality is that people are comfortable having uncomfortable conversations with people they feel they can relate to. So when we show up in communities, we don't come prepared with solutions to problems before we ever even hear what the problems are. We listen. We listen to the concerns and the issues that voters have, and we amplify their messages back to politicians and back to community leaders. And when we do that, we co-create better solutions, better communities, better policies, and an overall better America. Our country needs leadership that understands that they work for the people of this country. That means that we need leadership that listens. Leaders who are not afraid to take on the challenging questions. 
leaders who aren't campaigning from their basements and going on vacation 100 times a year. <laughs> we need leaders who encourage us to be the masters of our lives and of our circumstances, not leaders who encourage us to believe that we're victims of it. And most importantly, thank you. Most importantly, we need leaders who help us to restore the belief that the American dream is still alive and is now more attainable than ever. And the one promise that I can make you all tonight is that every speaker who graces this stage and who has graced this stage is one of those exact same leaders who I just described. And with your help, our organization is going to do what it takes to make sure that they drive this country forward. We have an opportunity to create historic change in this country come election time. The black vote is up for grabs. The black community wants a leader who is more energetic to go to bat for them than for their own personal gain. And I think we just, we have just a candidate for that. You'll hear from him pretty soon tonight. So. The next promise I'll make you guys is that our organization will be on the ground in the communities across the country, making sure that we spread these conservative principles and these messages that our conservative and our fearless conservative politicians are putting forward to make sure that we have not only a better black America, but a better America for all citizens. And with that, thank you guys again for coming out. We appreciate it. My name is Quentin Jordan. I'm the vice president of the Black Conservative Federation, and we can't thank you all enough for being here, so thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the president of the Black Conservative Federation, Deontay Johnson. all so much. I am speechless. I'm looking out over this room and I hope CNN is back there somewhere. I hope MSNBC, MSN, MSBC, because we got a room full of black conservatives. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, because I didn't see people stand up about this. We got a room full of black conservatives. And we got a room full of black conservatives that in November is going to vote to re-elect Donald J. Trump. Listen, the left better get ready because we're ready. Listen, the Black Conservative Federation, we are prepared. We're prepared and we are going to come after this election like we've never come after elections before. And the first group we're, tar we're targeting is black men. The Democratic Party has literally pushed black men aside. Not only have they pushed black men aside, they have taken them out of the homes. They've taken them out of the schools and they're trying to take them out of the, the birth room every chance they get. But ladies and gentlemen, they're coming back home and they're coming to the Republican Party President Donald Trump got 20% of the black vote in 2020, and I said it on Fox News, and people thought I was crazy, and I'm going to say it again today, that I believe that President Trump is going to get 50% of the black male vote. Our board member, Jack Brewer, said it. We have a donor here tonight that has graciously agreed to match every donation we receive today. I don't ask y'all for much. 
and I'm, we're not even asking you guys for much. $5, $10, $25, every cent goes into the field. And if you guys know the Black Conservative Federation, you know that we're putting people at, at the doors. We're knocking doors, and I'm probably going to call some of y'all to say, hey, do you got any door knockers in Wisconsin? Do you got any door knockers in Pennsylvania? Because we got to make sure that we win this election. Before I move any further, this event would not be possible without so many of you guys in the room. But when I look out of this room, I see our first event, we had 70 people. 70 people. Little conference room. That's where the after party is in a little conference room. But we had 70 people at our first event. But I had to give thanks to the best business partner, the best friend, confidant, and the best vice president I've ever had, and that is Quentin Jordan. And I have something for you. So to show my appreciation, I had to, I had to get him an amazing award because he's done a great job. And listen, y'all don't have to work with me. I'm not the easiest person to work with. So as I close, as I close, I just want to thank you all so much. We got, we got Secretary Carson in the room today. Can we give a hand clap for him? And his amazing wife, Candy. We have someone who is a mother to all, a grandmother to all, and just a loving person, the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King, Alveda, Alveda, Dr. Alveda King. Where's Bill Dotson and Modern Door for their amazing sponsorship for making sure that this event was possible? Dan Kramer, I see Dan Kramer there. We have so many amazing individuals. Modern Door, um, Rod Dorillas. I think, I think he's in the room. And I just thank you guys all. And listen, because my time is up and they're going to start dinging and everything. I just want to thank you guys. And listen, visit us at bcfaction.com and five, ten dollars We just ask to continue to keep this organization going. Thank you all and God bless you all. So I guess I'm still here because I got to give out some awards, some more awards. So the first person that I'm going to give this award to is an amazing individual. And you guys heard from her today. And when I pick up the phone and call her, she has the best spirit I've ever seen. Just, I've never seen her upset. Never seen her angry. And she just, she's really sold out for the movement. She's really in, in all in. And that person is Miss Mary Milben. Listen, did you guys enjoy her national anthem? Listen, we tried to find other singers and we even asked some members of Congress and they said, other than Mary? I'm like, well, listen, we look like we gotta do Mary. I'll keep it brief because I just like to sing and then go sit down and let everybody else talk. Let me just first, uh, real quick, I'll, I'll take a few minutes, uh, say thank you to Deontay Quentin and the Black Conservative Federation. It's wonderful to be here this evening and certainly an honor to celebrate God and celebrate America and people assembled in this room who love both. Tonight's theme was restoring the American, is restoring the American dream. And my story is the American dream. 
I'm just a little small town Oklahoma girl who loves Jesus, raised by a precious single mother, chosen by God to serve America. It is a blessing to serve, to give your life in service to God, love of country, and to all of you, America. As I approach the 20 year mark of singing across the world, what a blessing it has been that 15 years of this melodic journey has been dedicated to singing and serving America. From my days serving as a young staffer at the White House to President Bush, to now a professional career having sung for four consecutive US presidents, my favorite being the 45th president, my dear friend, President Trump, and I want to honor the president. It's been a blessing to travel all over the country for a long time with President Trump, singing our patriotic music, and he and the former First Lady, Melania Trump, have been very kind to me, and so I want to honor them uh, as he comes tonight. Singing the patriotic song track of our lives as Americans has been the greatest honor. I want you to take a minute tonight and reflect on your American journey, and you will see that all of our collective lives mirror the combination of service, truth, and freedom. These are not merely words, but the guiding principles that define who we are as individuals, as a community, and as a country. Service, a duty, and a privilege to make a meaningful impact in the lives of others and contribute to the greater good. Truth, the bedrock upon which trust, integrity, and progress are built. In a world inundated with misinformation and falsehoods, it is only the truth of God and holding ourselves accountable to that truth will a society truly be unified and free. And freedom, the bedrock of every American dream story, a foundation upon which democracy thrives, innovation flourishes, and human potential is unleashed. The freedom encompasses not only the absence of oppression, but also the presence of opportunity, equality, and justice for all. It is through safeguarding our freedoms that we ensure a future where every voice is heard, every dream is pursued, and every life is valued. As we navigate the complexities of our modern world, let us recommit ourselves to these timeless values. Let us embrace service, as a calling to uplift others, truth as a guiding light in times of uncertainty, and freedom as a beacon of hope for generations to come. Together, let us strive to build a society where service is honored, truth is revered, and freedom is cherished. Let me close with this. To serve, you have to have faith. To live in truth, you have to have hope. And to really be free, you have to love. As Americans, our DNA is the combination of faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. To win America in this election, we have to truly love America. To win the world, we have to truly love each other. This election, Let's go out and remind America who we really are. May God bless all of you. May God bless our 45th president, soon to be 47th president of the United States of America. And may God bless the United States of America. God bless you all. Thank you for this wonderful award. God bless you, Black Conservative Federation. Thank you again, Mary, for all of your hard work. This next individual, proud is an understatement. I've watched this individual from the age of 15, 14, 13 to 21, and I've seen him grow beyond measures. I've seen him go from an internet sensation to someone who is influencing policy and really pushing for the very ideals that we fight for. 
he's as a, I look at him as a little brother, I look at him as a mentee, but and most importantly, I look at him as a great addition to our movement. Ladies and gentlemen, C.J. Pearson. Well, God bless America and God bless the great state of South Carolina. How are you guys doing today? Well, first and foremost, I want to thank Deontay, Quentin, and the Black Conservative Federation for honoring me here today. You know, I first got involved in the conservative movement when I was just 12 years old because I knew then what I know now that the color of my skin should not dictate my politics. Never. And I stand before you today at 21 years old with a bold declaration that the generational curse is bestowed upon our community by the Democrat Party will end with my generation. We are going to fight back, we are going to lift our voices, and we are going to save this country. We're going to save this country. Because I got to tell you, you know, the folks in the media, they want to act like we don't exist. That black people are just A-OK -okay with the lies of the Democrat Party, with the destitution that Joe Biden has waged upon our community. And I've got to say that when I talk to people in our community, when I go to black churches, when I go to black barbershops, I hear people who are tired of settling for less. We're ready to settle for more. And that's exactly what we intend to do. That's exactly what we intend to do. And now my journey to this stage was a little bit unlikely. I was raised by my grandparents in a Democrat household, but the values that they gave me at such a young age, they taught me to love this country, to love my God, and to love my family. And I gotta tell you, that's the recipe for a conservative right there. That's the recipe for a conservative. You know, people often ask me, you know, at 21 years old, CJ, why do you care? Why do you fight? Or why do you care about the direction of this country? It's very simple to me. Because I realize that if we do not fight to save this country, my generation stands to have the most to lose. You know, Ronald Reagan once said that freedom is just one generation away from extinction. And I refuse to allow it to be my generation. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And my journey has taken me all across the country, working for PragerU and, you know, growing an online following of more than one and a half million people, seeking not just to preach to the choir, but to do the work to grow the congregation. Because I got to tell you that the lies that my generation has been told about conservatives, about the Republican Party, are not true in any way whatsoever. They say that we are the party of racists. But under President Donald J. Trump, we had the lowest black unemployment rate in our nation's history. HBCUs were fully funded. We had an advocate in the White House. And under Joe Biden, what do we have? A skeleton of a man. Nothing at all. And so uh, that is why I fight. And it's why actually I recently got involved in a campaign to be the next state representative for the state of Georgia. I'm currently in a runoff election. And in just 19 days, the youngest black legislator in America is going to be a MAGA Republican. Just imagine how mad that's going to make the left. And, and, and I've got to tell you, on day one, I am coming for Fannie Willis. And I dare her to use the race card on me. I dare her to use the race card on me. It's not going to happen. If, if she wanted to be somebody's sugar mama, that's her prerogative. But you don't get to use taxpayer dollars to do it. And we need leaders in Georgia who are going to fight back to right this ship. Because if we save Georgia, we can save America. But beyond that, guys, I I've got to tell you that the fight ahead of us is so important. November 5th is going to be a new day in America where young men and women are going to come together and cast their vote for Donald J. Trump. The black community is going to cast their vote for Donald J. Trump. And we are going to be motivated by this fact that the black community was destroyed by the Democrat Party. Now it is time for our community to destroy the Democrat Party. God bless you. God bless America. Let's go save this great nation. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, the next president of the Black Conservative Federation. Listen, before we do our next award, there's one important award that we want to give out. There's one important award we want to give out, so I, and I have to do it now. As you see this, you guys see this is a globe, right? This award is to the greatest president of all times. We are at the Black Conservative Federation, and media, I hope you're, I hope you're filming this. We at the Black Conservative Federation is awarding the Champion for Black America Award to President Donald J. Trump. Because there has been no greater champion than President Donald J. Trump. This next recipient, so I'm young, so don't judge me, but the first presidential campaign that I had the honor of working on was this, this amazing individual. And since I've known him, I have just known nothing but great things. He is one of the best people that you always, that you ever meet. He has one of the best wives that you ever meet. Um, I remember one time she was eating some fries at an event and she offered me some. I said, oh no, no, uh, Miss Carson, you can, <laughs> you can enjoy those fries. But this individual has been amazing from being a surgeon to as a secretary of housing and urban development. He has stood by our president from day one. He has stood by and through the attacks, through the lies and everything else. And we could not go on without making sure that we celebrate his life. And we like to celebrate lives when they're living. Not when, not when they leave, but we wanna celebrate them when they're alive. So this next lifetime, this Lifetime Achievement Award goes to the amazing secretary and Dr. Ben Carson. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Kenny and I are delighted to be here in, in a room full of conservative people. Uh, you know, I grew up in Detroit, very liberal place. Boston, very liberal place. New Haven, Connecticut, very liberal place. Ann Arbor, Michigan, very liberal place. Came to work in Baltimore, very liberal place. So I was a liberal. And... Uh, <laughs> And then, and then I did something liberals weren't supposed to do. I listened to a conservative. I listened to Ronald Reagan. And I said, he doesn't sound like a horrible racist person. He sounds just like my mother. <laughs> and I started making that transition uh, at that point. But you know, the most important thing when it comes to conservatism is recognizing the role of God in our lives. That is the most important thing. And he is so amazing, you know. I think about my life as a youngster. You know, I had a horrible temper. And uh, some of you probably know the story of when I tried to stab another youngster with a knife and he had on a metal belt buckle. And the knife blade saved him. The buckle saved him. But isn't it amazing how God takes a street knife meant to harm people and replaces it with a scalpel to save lives? And not only that, but God has a sense of humor. I'll tell you, because uh, after that stabbing incident, 
That day, I started reading from the book of Proverbs. I start every day and end every day reading from the book of Proverbs until this very day. And the book of Proverbs was written by Solomon. Well, my middle name happens to be Solomon. So he knew I was going to have that great affinity. But remember what happened in Solomon's life when he became king that brought him great fame? Two women claimed to be the mother of the same baby. And what did he do? He advocated dividing the babies. Well, isn't that when I became very well known when I divided babies? <laughs> so he knows what he's doing. But it is so vitally important for organizations like this one to counter the propaganda that is put forth by the leftists who want our young people you know, what does the Bible say? It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Well, guess what? Our enemies know that, too. And that's why Vladimir Lenin said, give me your children to teach for four years, and the seed that I sow will never be uprooted. That's why they're so interested in getting into our schools and indoctrinating our kids and convincing them that they're victims. You know, if you believe you're a victim, you are one. You know, if there was anybody who could claim to be a victim, it was my mother. You know, she came from a very large rural family, had less than a third grade education, bounced around from house to house, got married at age 13, trying to avoid that horrible situation. Years later, discovered that her husband was a bigamist. There she was trying to raise two young sons in the city by herself. And she never claimed victimhood. And she never let us be victims. And she never let us make excuses. If we ever made an excuse, the next thing out of her mouth was the poem called Yourself to Blame. And what a difference it made. And she prayed. That was the important thing. She prayed for wisdom because my brother and I were such horrible students. And... You know, God gave her the wisdom, at least in her opinion. My brother and I didn't think it was wise at all. I mean, turning off the TV and making us read books, what kind of wisdom was that? In today's world, we would have called social services. But, uh, but we had to read the books. And it really opened up a whole new world for me because we were very poor, but between the covers of those books, I could go anywhere, I could do anything, I could be anybody. I started reading about surgeons and scientists and entrepreneurs and explorers and I began to realize as I read those stories that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you it's not somebody else it's not some circumstance it's somebody else and what a difference that made in my life and you know I got to the point where if I had five minutes I was reading a book I went from being the dummy to being the bookworm. All the kids who used to laugh and call me names were coming to me saying, Benny, Benny, how do you work this problem? And I'd say, sit at my feet, youngster, while I instruct you. I was, uh, I was perhaps a little obnoxious, but boy, it made such a big difference and such a big difference in the way that I felt throwing away that victim mentality. And, you know, we need to really be courageous as we battle that. You know, a lot of people think the right way, but the problem is they're not courageous. They'd rather stand in the corner looking at their shoes than to speak up for what they believe. But we need to be willing to speak up. Somebody has to speak up. And have you noticed that the left always says, you can talk about anything, but don't talk about religion or politics. That's exactly what we should be talking about. Yeah. They do their best work undercover as they try to deceive people and dumb down the population. And we need to shine the light on them because I think it will make a big difference for our kids. And we need to, to help our young people to understand that they have a very proud heritage in this country. I mean, right now, many people say that young black males 
are an endangered species. Why? Because there are more in prison than there are in college. Because homicide is the number one cause of death. And it didn't have to happen because anybody of any nationality could have taken that six-year-old black boy and walked down the streets of this city, given him a black history lesson he would have never forgot. Could have started by pointing to his shoes and saying it was John Mautzliger, a black man who invented the automatic shoe lasting machine, revolutionized the world of shoes, and go out into that clean street. Charles Brooks, a black man who invented the street sweeper, those big machines with the brushes on them. And down that street comes a big refrigerated tractor trailer truck. And you can tell them that it was um, Frederick Jones. Jones. There's my wife. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Frederick Jones, who invented the air conditioning system for trucks, later adopted for airplanes, boats, and trains. And it comes to a stop at the red light. It was Garrett Morgan who invented the traffic signal. You can tell how he invented the gas mask, saved lots of lives during the war. While you're talking about the war, Henrietta Bradbury, a black woman who invented the underwater cannon, made it possible to launch torpedoes from submarines. You walk past the hospital. Charles Drew and his contributions to blood banking, understanding the function of blood plasma. Daniel Hale Williams, the first successful open-heart surgery in the world, had an operative mortality rate of less than 1.5%. You look up at the surgical light, Thomas Edison. You didn't know he was black, did you? Well, he wasn't, but... uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but his right-hand man, Louis Latimer, was, and you can tell how Louis Latimer came up with the filament that made the light bulb work for more than two or three days, invented the electric lamp diagram, the telephone for Alexander Graham Bell, was a tremendous inventor in his own right. And then you walk past the railroad track, and you talk about Andrew Beard, the automatic railroad car coupler spurred on the Industrial Revolution, Elijah McCoy, the automatic lubrication system for locomotive engines, had so many inventions, people were always trying to imitate them. And they would say, is that a McCoy? Is that the real McCoy? You've got racist people like David Duke talking about the real McCoy, don't even know who he's paying homage to. And I'm just barely scratching the surface. I could go on for a long time talking about those contributions. But I'll tell you what's really great about America. I can take that same walk down the street for virtually any nationality and point out great things that were contributed by that nationality. And that's how America became great so fast, because we had so many people with so many talents. Our diversity is not a problem. It is a blessing. And we have to be the ones who spread the word. And if you're black and you're a conservative, they hate you. Because the the leftists, they work best in darkness. And they don't want you to know what's going on. They don't want you to know, for instance, that the Democrats were the party of slavery. The Republican Party was founded as an abolitionist party. It was the Republicans who aided the freedmen. It was the Republicans who pushed for the Civil Rights Act and for the Voting Rights Act. And who was it who divided the black population of the slaves? Think about it. They would tell the slaves in the house, you're better than the ones in the yard. And the ones in the yard, you're better than the ones in the field. Why? Because they had to keep them divided. They had to keep them fighting each other. And then after slavery was over, the light-skinned ones, you're better than the middle-skinned ones, and you're better than the dark-skinned ones. Keep them fighting each other, not being able to get together. And it just has continued to this very day as they try to divide blacks who have different opinions about politics. They don't want us to get together, amalgamate that power, and become a, a vital force. But we have to make sure that we get the word out there, we spread it, and, and does it sometimes mean that people will say mean things and take jabs at you? Yes, it does. But you know the way I kind of look at it? Against the backdrop of eternity, what is a little bit of discomfort here? It means nothing. We don't have to worry about that. All we have to do is worry about our relationship with God. And stop worrying about those people who say separation of church and state. That's not in the Constitution. And... 
You know, our Constitution, our Constitution is a magnificent document. And I can tell you from working with uh, President Trump that he understands it. And this is a man who had tons of money, who was already as famous as anybody could be. He didn't need this. And uh, I remember watching an interview with Oprah 30 years ago, and she said, would you ever run for president? He said, no, not unless I thought the country was going off a cliff. And he put himself out there think if he had not won and Hillary had won and we had three more Supreme Court justices that were left us, we would already be over that cliff. And you know, the Lord provides different kinds of leadership for different times. In the Bible, he used all kinds of people. And you think about King David, who murdered, who committed adultery, who did all kinds of things. God said, he's a man after my own heart because he repented and he sought redemption from God. Donald Trump will do that as well. I've talked to him. And those people who say, I like his policies, but I, I just can't stand them. I couldn't possibly vote for somebody like that. Well, you know, I say, what if you were sick, you had a terrible disease, and it required a skillful surgeon? Which surgeon would you rather have? The one who has terrible bedside manner but has a tremendous record? or the one who has a wonderful bedside manner but kills everybody. You know? <laughs> so, God, God will provide us with what we need. God loves us. We love him. He will give us what we need, but we have to do our part. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to South Carolina's very own, Senator Tim Scott. Hello from all over the world. God bless you. How are you doing? Excellent, excellent. I will say I love the concept, the topic of restoring the American dream. One of the things I think about when I think about restoring the American dream is where my dream started. My dream started with a little lady named Frances Scott, my mother. Here's a woman working 16 hour days, trying to keep the lights on and food on the table. And she taught me early on, she said, son, if it is to be, it's up to me that I had to take the individual responsibility to make sure I invested all I had into the life the good Lord and my mama gave to me. Now, how many of y'all know that even when you get good information and good advice, you don't always follow it? I am not the only one. Good, 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 good. So by the time I was a freshman in high school, my mother working those 16 hours days, giving me the dream of shooting for the moon, and even if you miss it, you'll be among the stars. If I heard that one time, I heard it a thousand times. But unfortunately for me, I didn't pay close attention. So as a freshman, I failed out of high school, failing four subjects. I failed world geography. I think I'm the first senator to fail civics which is the study of politics. I will say, though, after 10 years in the United States Senate, I am not the only person failing civics in America's capital. A lot of my friends to the left are failing civics, too. I also failed Spanish and English. Lord have mercy on me. When you fail Spanish and English, no one calls you bilingual. No, they call you bi because you can't speak in any language. But as I think back of that kid failing out, 
I had two major blessings. One was a mother who believed that prayer was the key and faith would unlock the door. And she taught me to put my faith in God, no matter my circumstances, no matter the situation. One of the most important keys to restoring the American dream is having a faith-filled country where all things are possible. I met a mentor, John Moniz, a Chick-fil-A operator who taught me Luke 6.38. He taught me that if you're going to restore and experience your American dream, you have to first give before asking to receive. That's Luke 6.38. That if you give, it shall be given unto you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall it come back to you. Uh, those two pillars in my life helped me to understand that all things were still possible even for a kid who had lost his way. I'll tell you this, though. As that child who went to four different elementary schools by the fourth grade, quality education is a necessity for experiencing the American dream. And if we are... And if we are going to experience the American dream, we must make sure that every zip code in America has quality education. And that will take, that will take having a president who believes in school choice. A president like Donald Trump. We must believe in our own future and have that future start in every single zip code in America. As my education continued, I finished high school on time because my mother, that freshman year, as she went through the shooting for the moon and missing it, she also taught me that there are consequences to your actions. Let me say that one more time. There are consequences to your actions. Can I get an amen? I only have four minutes, so I'm going to make this quick. How many of y'all think that the consequences for me were time out? How many of y'all think that consequences for me was a stern conversation? How many of y'all know the consequences for me was going out to the tree and picking your own switch? And having a conversation about consequences. That was my mama. I'm not sure about your mama, but it sounds like you grew up with her too. But in the end, I learned very quickly that if I applied myself, when you overcome your obstacles, you start seeing a brighter future. My mentor taught me I was blessed with the greatest citizenship on all of God's green earth, being an American. And as an American, all things are possible if you work hard. And John Moniz taught me that having a job is a good thing, but creating jobs is even better. John taught me that if you have a good income, you will have a pretty good lifestyle. But if you create a profit, you can change your community. Restoring the American dream means having people in leadership who appreciate the importance of allowing the American people to have their money back, which is tax cuts. And as a senator who helped write the TCJA, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the one thing I had an opportunity to do was to think back and remember that those folks living in poverty like I grew up, they need all the cash they can keep. And cutting taxes by 70% for a single mother is one of the ways that we as conservatives can restore hope, create opportunities, and bring the American dream back to the poorest communities in this country. And by doing so, we usher in free markets and capitalism. That is a beautiful thing. I'll wrap it up with this. 
I've been on the trail for the last several weeks. Tomorrow is a really important election here in South Carolina. It is time for us to move to the general election, which means tomorrow I'm asking all my friends and supporters to vote for Donald Trump. So we get four more years of a president who believes in school choice. So we get four more years of a president who believes in tax cuts. We get four more years of a president who wants to close our southern border. We, we get four more years of saving American lives from the disaster of fentanyl coming across our southern borders. But we also get the privilege of firing Joe Biden and eliminating Bidenomics. We also get the privilege here in South Carolina tomorrow of making the decision to send the message to America that restoring the American dream starts with South Carolina's Republican primary, where we decide Donald J. Trump is our next president and our nominee. God bless the United States of America. Looks like you've been sleeping well. Megan, he's back. The My Pillow guy. And you're looking good. I'm still feeling good. Well, just when you thought it couldn't get any better, we've got the best pillow ever, My Pillow 2.0. <gasps> when I invented My Pillow, it had everything you'd ever want in a pillow. Well, now there's new technology that makes it even better. My Pillow 2.0 has my patented fill combined with a cooling fabric with temperature regulating thread. My Pillow 2.0 is truly the next generation of My Pillow. Now's the time to go to mypillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use the promo code to save 50% on your My Pillow 2.0. Not only that, for a limited time your entire order ships absolutely free. You're sleeping even better and cooler too. And you're looking good. Feeling good. I knew you would. MyPillow.com. All right, we're back out here uh, waiting for President Trump to uh, take the states there in South Carolina. And I was just kind of getting some information about tomorrow. Uh, President Trump speaking uh, tomorrow here at CPAC to wrap up the uh, show on Saturday. Um, incredible. You know, obviously, Tim Scott, an amazing senator from South Carolina. Um, obviously delivering really a, 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 an effective speech. And I think people, not only is he popular in South Carolina, it's pretty popular around the country. It really is. Everyone loves Tim Scott. And, you know, you know this really tells you something about President Trump. When you have Tim Scott and, and the governor and, you know, so many uh, All these endorsements. <laughs> endorsements coming in for President Trump in Nikki Haley's home state, what does that tell you? The writing is on the wall that the people of South Carolina want President Donald J. Trump. And we are waiting for him to take the stage here momentarily. And, uh, you know, he spoke earlier at an event, and now he's uh, going to be here uh, on uh, this next second event of the night. And so... Uh, we will have that for you here in just a second, but we want to remind you what tax season upon us, Tax Network USA. The experts there are waiting on you to help you. That's what they are there for. They want to help you with any of your tax needs, whether you have back taxes that are keeping you up at night and wondering how you're going to pay those or just the taxes in general for this last year. That's where the experts come in. And it doesn't matter which state you live in. They are... Uh, they have their uh, license in every single state. So make sure that you give them a call or you log online, TNUSA.com. The information's on your screen. Make sure you check that out. Write it down, TNUSA.com. There's also a 1 800 number for you to call. Let the experts handle 
this for you. Don't worry about it anymore. Just log on or call that number and they will take care of it for you. That's why they're here and that's why we're telling them uh, are telling you about them. So Tax Network USA, the experts are standing by. They are able to help every American, no matter which state you live in. And they have so many happy customers, thousands of happy customers. Let yourself be the next happy customer. Yeah, also, this is not the time for Christmas. This is not the, this is the cold and flu season and everyone is uh, getting sick around you. I know so many people in the last couple weeks that have been getting uh, ill. So your immune system is now working overtime. And so why not do your favor, your health a favor by ordering your very own germ stopping, order cleansing, toxin purifying tri -air, air today. Now this is a new product to right side. I'm just kind of going over, the, going over the notes here and make sure I get it all correct because I want to make sure that you guys know exactly what this thing does. The Triad Air will clean up your cat and dog dander, your litter box smells for your pets and your grandchildren at school or jabbed uh, friends and vaccine shedding. This is something that's going to purify the air. Look, you've got it. so much toxins floating around in your air right now. Uh, everything from your litter box to the carpet to the dust in your house. And let me let me. I mean, there's so many things floating around your house right now. I was talking to a friend the other day who's actually a contractor back at home in Texas, and you know, my family was sick last week. Uh, we used the medical emergency kit uh, right. from Dr. Peter McCullough, but everyone slept in different rooms. And so my friend, who's a contractor, he builds homes. He says that's pointless because your air conditioning unit. That air flows through and recycles and goes through each room. But if you have an air purifier, something like that, to clean the air, that's exactly what you need. Now, I, I do have one at another location. It wasn't actually at the house we were in. But that's just what you need, something to clean the air. Yeah, this stuff works. So if you have pets, uh, of course, depending on carpet in your home and dust, and you never have to change the filter on this, the information for this is on your screens. Their customers are not only... Uh, just satisfied. They love this thing. The uh, one air filter unit is to last for a lifetime. Go to airwaterhealing.com. Use the promo code RSBN. Look, you spend most of your life in the house. <laughs> Believe it or not, you sleep in your house, you cook, you watch TV, house. you love your house. So you want the air to be pure in yes. your house. And so this product is designed to really take all of those toxins and all of the dust particles in your house and filter it through so that you don't actually breathe it through your own lungs. Uh, and that's what our friends over uh, there do that. The information is on your screen. Take advantage. This is the first time they've ever really advertised with us. So I want our, you know, our viewer base to really take advantage. Hit them up on the website. Go, go check them out. Go at least get information on that. And, you know, the price point on it is great. So not only are you, you know, saving some money, but you're also making your, your life better and cleaner. Go check it out. The information is on your screen. And I just love the idea that the air that you're breathing at home, when you're in your pajamas, you're watching a movie, you're cooking, whatever the case may be, your air, the air is clean, and, and it's purifying that air. And so what better way? It, now is the time to make sure that you get one of these products. Too. It's interesting because you've got water purifiers in your home. Yeah. Okay, everyone wants to have clean drinking water, so why wouldn't you want your air to be clean? I mean, that seems like a pretty <laughs> common sense approach to living a healthy, clean life. So go check it out. The information for that is on your screen. Looks like we're probably maybe moments away. Check time. It's 8.02 here, uh, local time there in Nashville. We're wrapping up day two of CPAC, and we just got some information that... Uh, uh, well, tomorrow is going to be a it's going to be a long day. It really is, yeah. It, so. You know, the, all three days have been extremely. It feels like extremely long because CPAC, you know, it does go from bell to bell, but then we have other Trump speeches at the same time, and so it seems like we're just thirteen, fourteen I'll be hours. Honest with you, I am so tired right now. I am so tired, <laughs> but at the same time, my energy is just going. Like this is so, it's fun to me. It's, it's feeding me. It's giving me the, the energy to keep going. It's the people here. It's the vibe here. It's President Trump on the campaign trail. All of that stuff. Who needs sleep? We are just going and going and going. And I love it. But that's, you know, 
that that is what this campaign's going to do. It's going to go, especially after Super Tuesday. Now we're going to be live on Super Tuesday down in Mar-a-Lago for the election night. I think there are some couple couple of rallies before that, the weekend before that. We'll announce those here in a, in a little bit. Uh, but it's going to be nonstop. But that's the year. That, that's 2024. And that's exactly what it was in 2020. Uh, and before you came on, I'm like, it was President Trump would do three or f- get this, Vanessa, three or four a day we were doing. So you, you and I could do two and we're exhausted. Imagine doing three or four. Of course, we'll, have, we'll you know, build out our crews all over the country, but this is campaign season. Scratch everything I just said. I'm tired. I need a nap. <laughs> Already. No. All right. Let's talk about the freetrumpbook.com. Freetrumpbook.com. I love this thing. I really do. I think it's one of these amazing uh, publications that not only teaches what President Trump did in office, but it, it illustrates it as well. It's an easy read, so if you have a young uh, you know, someone in your life that's just kind of learning to read. What a great book to do it with. So go check it out. The information for that is on your screen. Free It's free. Now you do have to pay for shipping and handling, but hey, that's that's a slight price to pay when you're getting all the facts that President Trump did while he was in office. Free Double box look at what's happening now there in South Carolina, waiting for President Trump to take the stage there. For it almost seems like the third time. I mean, yesterday... What did you call it earlier? A triple header? It's a triple header. Yeah, it really is. I said on our internal chat that today was a triple header with President Trump, because when was the last time Joe Biden did a single header? (laughs) You know, he doesn't... There was a point, Vanessa, that he did... I'm still thinking about it. I don't know. Well, there's a point that he didn't even do an open press conference. It had been, I think, nine or ten months since he did an open press engagement with the, you know, open, I say open press. He steps out there and lets the press ask him any questions about anything. Uh, it wasn't on a particular topic. Uh, it's been months since he's I think done the that. The last time he did that, that I can remember, it was when uh, he was talking about the uh, his memory that the, the the results that had come in that they weren't going to charge him for the the illegal documents or not the do- illegal documents the uh, documents that were found in his garage. He did come out. He made a statement, and then he answered some questions from. Re- reporters very angry very upset it was clear as day that he was mad um, about uh, this decision and and the wording in it saying that his memory was poor and his age talking about his age that's probably the last time and I think that's been at least a month or so remember when he did the emergency press conference it was he announced about an hour out that's it right i think that might have been it i was in vegas when he announced that and i had some friends in the mainstream media that worked for cnn and nbc and um they said do you have any idea what this is about that, that's exactly they the same had one. Yep. no idea let me right. tell you something when when the president announces an impromptu press conference with no subject people go to the worst places he's resigning He's announcing that he's Kamala's never going to be up next. Yeah, conflict. We're launching nuclear missiles to somebody. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to run for president. So that's what they instantly went to, uh, which was interesting. But it ended up being, you know, something not near, you know, serious about that. But pre- what President Trump does is unheard of. It really is. It's unheard of. I don't remember, you know, Barack Obama doing that. I don't remember any of the Bush doing that either one senior or junior um carter no i mean clinton no president trump is a machine i mean he really is and he's a machine at the age he is now you know when you look back at video of him back when he was on um, oprah and some other daytime talk shows you know they they hinted at this presidential run and when you look back on it now, you go, my goodness, you know, he had it in his head that this is what he wanted to do. And, you know, if we can only, you know, fast forward to 2016, we can know exactly what he did. But President Trump is absolutely a machine, a political machine that we've never seen a movement. Think about this for a second. All the people we've had on the show, think of, we've had all kinds of people 
on our pre-shows. We just, you know, all ages, Forgiato Blow, we've had Latinos for Trump. We've had them all on our show. I cannot think of one single political figure in modern history that is transcended across every other ethnic background. Do you remember when he first ran in? I'm going to take my IFB out for a second so I can hear myself think. Do you remember when he first ran and the left said women will not like Trump? He's vulgar. He says this on Twitter. He's this. He's that. Women will not like him. And I'm sitting at home, yeah. wasn't with Right Side Broadcasting at the time, and I was thinking, well, I love him. Is there something wrong with me? Like, my mom loves him. She's sitting right next to me. So there's two votes right there. And so then you have women for Trump come out. The women love him. We can't get enough of him. He's just amazing and what he does for women and our rights. So then you have, you know, um, Forgiato Blow, the rappers. They're, Forgiato Blow talked about it today. He is getting so many rappers who are wanting to sign with him because they are MAGA rappers. They're, they are, they're conservative right. rappers. They're not your everyday rapper who talks about women and guns and violence and cash and drugs. That's not their style. They want to come over to the conservative movement. So now he's he's reaching out to the to, to the rappers, the Latinos, like you just mentioned, the Latinos for Trump. Latinos love them. Him. Cubans love him. How many how much time have we spent in Florida? Cubans love him. The elderly love him when it comes to social security, whatever the case may be. The younger generation loves him. Uh, look at Daniel Fetter, who has Patriot Kids uh, Foundation. He's 12 years old. We had him on the show yeah. today. Loves him. He just came out with this. I could go on and on. You want me to keep going? We. He just came out with the, the shoe, the high top, broke the internet, sold out within minutes. There is not an age group, Brian. There, Who doesn't love President Trump? Other than the left, who just wants to take him down. That's it. Yeah. Americans, the people who matter, love President Trump. They do. Pause that thought. Let's talk about our friends over at Tax Network USA. If you're suffering uh, tax uh, delinquency and you owe back taxes, perhaps you haven't paid your taxes in a year, two years, ten years, uh, perhaps you owed a thousand, ten thousand, doesn't matter. Our tap friends over at Tax Network USA have the experts and the plan in place to help you get out from under your tax issues. Now, it's really easy. The information is on your screen. Go check it out right now. Tax Network USA. We've had thousands of our viewers reach out to us and say, look, you know, you guys started promoting this company, and I haven't paid my taxes in a year, two years, whatever the case may be. Now they've eliminated it. They have, you know, on, on my behalf, uh, come out and spoke out against my taxes, they lower the tax bill, taxusa.com, that's taxusa.com. Uh, I want to give her master control to queue up uh, Cheryl Hughes' interview, if we can, uh, I'm sorry, not Cheryl Hughes, uh, the gentleman, make um, America Christian again. This is a, a gentleman that came on, We earlier we talked to him about really building the faith in our in our country and and bringing god back to a center and you know what he is running for president and i and i think and i think it was really interesting daryl constantine yeah daryl constantine he came up and said hey i'm running for president and i said okay well let's you know let's pump the brakes on that for a second and he goes yeah but i'm what i'm really doing is wanting to get the republican party on the the page that I think we should be on as far as as our faith. I was like, okay, well, I think we're all for that. And so he sat down with us and kind of laid out his game plan on how to make American Christian again. And his number one platform was really protecting our kids. And I think that both of us having kids, we were like, okay, we can, we can sign up for that. Is he intending on winning the presidency? Absolutely not. He right. knows he that. Knows. He knows that. This is just him witnessing to the word of God of being out there and on and, and advocating for Christian, Judeo-Christian uh, values as well. So we'll get to that here in just a second. But first, let's talk about our friends over the Birch Code Group. Uh, we've talked about the economy. We've talked about inflation. It's the number one issue a lot of people are dealing with. Uh, protect your savings. Go to Birch Gold. Text the words Trump to 989898. That is the Birch Gold Group. They will send you a free information kit. You can make the decision on your own. 
uh, and go check it out. There's no obligation. I'll tell you how to transition from a gold, from a traditional IRA into a gold-backed IRA. It's easy. Birch Gold Group. Text the words Trump to nine eight nine eight nine eight. That is the Birch Gold Group. Okay, so this is what we uh, met earlier about. Make American Christian again. Let's listen in. This guest wants to make America Christian again. And let me tell you something, Vanessa, there is nothing wrong with that. Daryl Constantine joins us here on the show, wants to make America Christian again. Also, you're actually running for president. I am, and clearly not doing a very good job of it, because I imagine this might be the first time uh, many of your audience members are hearing my name. I do feel, obviously, we're pretty far in the process, and full anticipation is that Trump is going to be the nominee. As I said from the onset, I will be supporting the nominee as I have my entire life as a lifelong Republican. Nevertheless, I am running because I believe that there are deficient points on the Republican Party platform, and I feel morally obligated to step forward with those until I see those reflected in the party. So I appreciate the opportunity to share my message with your audience, which is really all that I've asked for from the onset. And, you know, I do have some frustration with the party media apparatus that I have not been able to do so because I think when you look at the scope of voices, I think that the things that I'm saying are very much in line with where the party is at. So, again, I'm just very honored that you guys would give me that opportunity, and it's very nice to be sitting here. Absolutely. That's very respectful. We we enjoy that as well. Okay. What would you like for the Republican Party to focus? I mean, how, if you could have a voice on kind of their guidance, what would that be? I mean, what could they change? Yeah. So, you you know, there's two things, and, and really my my political vision was to make the 2024 election a referendum on protecting children from the LBGT agenda. Mm-hmm. And I'm willing to negotiate on a variety of fiscal topics with the left, but my message is the children are off limits. And I want to make <laughs> them own that topic by putting everything else, health care, minimum wage, all of these, you know, meat and potatoes, blue collar things. We all understand economics, capitalism is best served for everybody, but at the end of the day, I really want to pigeonhole the Democrats and make them take ownership of that issue. And I believe if we do that, what we find is that 90 to 95 percent of the American people fundamentally understand that these things do not belong around children. Now, what makes me unique to the other candidates is that I clearly articulate what that is. Ron DeSantis. He does some things, and he'll point to an example, but we have to actually set a boundary. We have to set a number, and for me, that number is 18. Nothing crosses that line, that lifestyle with minors. This is where we cross the line of consenting adults and tolerance and all of these things, which, of course, we support. The line, this is why marriage is such a fundamentally important topic, because that's the line where it stops being about consenting adults and becomes impacting the rights of children and the rights of a child to have a mother and a father, as biology dictates, should supersede the rights of a same-sex couple to experience something they would never experience in nature. So for me, that line needs to be 18. If there's one bullet point for my campaign that I want to see reflected in the Republican Party platform, it's that. So that means books, Pride Month, TV, anything cultural, we're treating this like we do anything else that we don't do not believe belongs around minors. We have to actually define what that boundary is. If somebody thinks that's too high, you know, I wanted to know what is Ms. Mr. Ron DeSantis's line? What is the line where he believes it's appropriate for minors to be exposed to this lifestyle? To me, that number is 18. So that's item one. Item two is culture. Culture is dictating everything. And this is the common conservative anecdote. Politics are downstream of culture. What I see with republicanism and conservatism, I've observed this my entire life, is we're very good at pointing at things and complaining about them, but we don't really think about how do we actually stop these. So like every year, the Super Bowl halftime show, we observe this. What we're basically watching are Babylonian fertility rituals, okay, being blasted out globally. (laughs) And we all get on our phones and we tweet our complaints about these things. But then the question becomes, now what? And our freedom, liberty-centric model doesn't actually enable us to do the types of things that are needed to put these in place. Freedom and liberty are very important, fundamental pieces of any republic. But it's not more important than God. And freedom and liberty presupposes a certain national consensus. And right now, we don't have a national consensus. What we have is a nonviolent civil war. So the first order of business... You know, it's funny. I've said that for years, Daryl. 
This is a non-violent civil war. That's I've right. said that for years. That's right. That's You're right. right. You have. And I appreciate you leading on that topic. And it is important, the first order of business for the Republican candidate, we are being sent there to win that war. So first order of business, we must win the civil war. And then we can return to the laissez-faire libertarian principles that we had in mind for this country. But until that happens, we have to be <laughs> willing to enact policies with a little bit more teeth. We have to be willing to enact restraints on the culture in particular. Our own CIA has been using media for decades to brainwash and weaponize and manipulate. So this is not something that we can treat the same as two companies selling toothpaste. Because the people behind the technology, keep in mind, they know much more about it than we do. You know the old, back in the 50s or whenever we caught them flashing the popcorn in the movies and we go, we buy the popcorn? So we caught that, but think now what we see, know that there's many layers behind that. And because this is effectively a brainwashing weapon, we as the American people, we actually must implement restrictions and guidance on that community. We must. We have a responsibility and we have a right to do that. Now, you know, this makes people a little bit uncomfortable because we're talking about things like freedom of speech. So one of my things, I want a federal ban on pornography, things of this nature. But the bottom line is that I'm not driving in with a tank and an army of people behind me. The premise of my campaign is that in a democracy, we have the right to vote for the changes that we want. And I wanted to put that on the ballot and give the American people an opportunity that if you want to do something serious on the cultural front and actually stop this decomposition of the nation and turn us back towards God and actually get us on a pathway to life, at least you're going to have an opportunity to do that on the ballot. And that's my challenge to Republicans, is to think creatively, to stop thinking so much in terms of conserving and defending, because there's not much left to defend. You know, you look around at the country, I don't really, I don't gauge my perspective in terms of what I see on TV or what, I go outside and I look at my country. And that's the bottom line. And I see a country that is going in a wrong direction, regardless of who's in the White House. And I want to see a platform in the Republican Party that addresses that. And the first order of business is, again, to make America Christian again. We have to turn back towards God. That dictates everything that we do domestically as well as geopolitically. It recalibrates the entire orientation of the nation in that direction. I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, God-loving woman. I think we need to put God uh, back into schools, into public places, and and and, and God you teach our children about God. remember praying before school, don't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Well, Do you I went to Catholic praying? school, yeah, so well, I can't. I remember having yeah. the Pledge of Allegiance, and you did all the, the Absolutely. standard protocol. So I, I'm 100% with you on all of that. But where I believe that you're going to find a problem is the, the argument, of course, of church versus state. Yeah, and to me, my, my answer to that is that a policy is a policy. So I'm going to put a policy in place that are ethical standards on the entertainment industry, period. Now, those are going to be informed by my own value system, which is Judeo-Christian, but that's not actually in the policy itself. So I'm implementing things that I feel are necessary to do, the same way that the left is implementing a Luciferian demonic agenda. <laughs> so, and they're getting, that's really what we, this is what we're seeing. And, and libertarianism, again, it's a great thing. It presupposes a national consensus. But what we find is that when we retreat from sort of the natural role of the right wing, which actually isn't to be the advocate of liberty and freedom, that's very important. But keep in mind, this is the term classical liberalism. So that's actually, we're actually occupying what a healthy left wing occupies. When the American people turn to the right wing, they're looking for structure and direction. And our, uh, our refusal to do that, to want to give that structure because we're afraid of being called this or that, by stepping back from our role to be at the head of the table, we've invited the left to come in and they've imposed a very disordered, uh, feminine, frankly, Luciferian and demonic authority instead. He is not saying anything well, that we have literally right. said over the last yes. days. And I will go back to the to the children. Uh, I know that there's a Protect Children's Innocence Act, which Marjorie Taylor Greene put on the floor that makes it a felony to do any gender affirming care on anyone under the age of 18, it makes it a felony. So what you're saying there is in direct support of what she's wanting. If you're Absolutely. 21 years old and you want to transition, uh, that's on you. And you you're want to pay the $450,000 to dismember yourself. Yes. That's correct. That's irreversible when you start taking the that's puberty right. blockers. And, and you know, I'm, I'm at the point even on that topic where that was originally my stance was if you want to pay the half a million dollars and you're over the age of 18. But now I'm kind of looking at it as, no, this is just not a thing for a 
a functional no, ethical I, society to I allow. agree with you on it's, that. It's incumbent upon that community to demonstrate a scientific hypothesis for their condition. And until they do that, we are not going to be in the business under a Constantine administration of allowing anybody to mutilate themselves because we see what that does in the suicide rates. Oh, we see no. that. So we have to actually, instead of get out of the mindset of, well, you can do this if you want, I'm at the point of, you know what, it's gone too far. Actually, no. I'm going to say no on this topic. Okay. i got to cut you short real quick because yeah. we got to get back into programming. Thank What's you. the best website for Make America Christian Again that people want to say, you know what, Constantine's talking about a lot of cool stuff, and I, I can get on with what he's talking about. Uh, where's the website? Well, Constantine2024.com. Okay, there we go. Uh, Daryl Constantine joining. I, I would say 99, I'd say 100% of the stuff that he just talked about, I can get we, on we board for. We need to bring back Christianity into this. Yeah, and I like I like what he's doing. I mean, yes, he's he's running for president, but really, it's, it's, a, it's a platform for you to push Christianity, and there's zero tolerance on pushing back on demonic forces. C correct. And my intention is to be president. Now, we did not obviously do it in 2024, but I'll be continuing with my message and pushing forward. I'm here now as a contingency plan in case Donald Trump is prevented by running for legal purposes and Nikki Haley being parachuted in, something for the grassroots. So that's Which what you're against that, now. by the way. I'm against that. Yeah. So I'm going to support the nominee. I fully expect that to be Donald Trump. And again, I really appreciate you guys. Yeah, God bless. No, that's why God we gave you, you the, the time on the air to do that. Hey, we got plenty more coming ahead. Thank you. Uh, stick around. All right, so make America Christian again. I, I do see a lot of his points on there. I do see a lot of his points. Look, we are a God-loving country. Uh, we want to put God first in everything that we do. We want to bring God back to schools and to libraries and teach our children, children all about our faith. Um, where I question, though, Brian, is how far he thinks he's going to go in his race. And he kind of laughed at me when I, when I was typing his name into the computer. I said, how do you spell your last name? And he says, well, I guess I'm not doing a good job for running for president if you don't know who I well, am. But, I, you know, yeah. so. That's, but, you know, and if, oh, honestly, I could run for president. Anybody can Anybody run for can president. Anybody can run for president. Yes. You get your signatures. You just submit your ballot. Um, you, you, you know, you submit your campaign fees and all that good stuff. I think, honestly, he is trying to promote an element of Christianity in our government that it has a zero tolerance on a lot of things that we talked about. That's it. I'd rather him just say, make America Christian again and take out the thing that I'm running for political office because that, that only leads... It almost debunks what he's trying to do in It a almost way. does because, honestly, everyone knows he's not going to win, so there's a loss there. If you just say, hey... I want to just make sure that America stays a, a Judeo-Christian nation, then we could all agree that that's something we could all get on board with. But when he makes it political in the fact that he's running for office, then people automatically put up a wall that says, oh, wait a minute. We're not taking I, you seriously. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what it is. And I want so. to take him seriously because he does have a great uh, uh prospect on what the country should be like when it comes to Christianity and bringing back God into our country. And I, and I agree with him 100% on most of what he said. But at the same time, when you say, I want to do this and run for president, that's where I'm like, mm. yeah. but I do, I, I wish him the best when it comes to um, bringing God back into our lives, because we all know we need that right we now. We need it. And you know what, when I brought up the uh, Protect Children's Innocence Act, which is a, a bill that was brought to the House floor that basically says it's a felony to per, uh, perform gender-affirming cares on minors. Vanessa, you would think that there wouldn't be a single person in D.C. that would be against that. Not one person. But instead, Democrats are against it, and several Republicans are, are against it. You're mutilating a child. <laughs> That's what I don't You're understand. You're mutilating a child. You're taking a body part of a child and changing it however you want to because of science or because of your beliefs or whatever the case may be. It's crazy. It's insane. I don't like it. It's disgusting. It should be a felony. Period. End of discussion. Well, Facts. when you look at what you can do and you can't do under the age of 18, you can't buy tobacco. Right. You can't buy alcohol. You can't vote. You can't join the military. You can't rent a car can't rent a hotel room. I mean, we can do another list right. of things that, I mean, that we've said yeah. as a society that we've set, you know, an, an age limit to what is considered someone a consenting adult and what is not. Um, 
yeah, I, I, we have to have some type of standard. Or we, are, we are just some third world country that, does, that has no moral compass on what is right and what is wrong. I, I like what he's doing. I, I just want to take the political aspect yeah. out of it. Like you're not competing with anybody else, even though he did say, you know, I will vote for, I will support President Trump if he's the nominee, which he will be. And if he's the president, which he will be, um, he'll support that. So, you know, um, it's just, uh, it's, it's interesting when you add a competitive element to it, to an election of what that does to people. Because no matter how on point your message is, people automatically go, well, we all, well, you know, I, I, I support Trump 100%. Well, so do we. But we also support what he wants. So um, I, I kind of wish it was, in a way, a state's issue. And what, I'm, what I mean by that, let me back up. I, I wanted a federal issue because I want, the, I want it to be implemented through the states. But if states would drive that initiative... Like, in other words, if Texas would say, boom, you can't perform gender-affirming care under anybody under the age of 18, then maybe other states would follow. Boom. New Mexico. Well, New Mexico's not going to do it, by the way. But, like, Louisiana would, would probably go on board. Arizona would probably be on board. Florida would Florida? be on board. Like, that's how we do it. Uh, so it's, um, you know, it's kind of like when earlier we talked to a gentleman in Colorado. We talk about the legalization of marijuana. Let me tell you something. When you legalize marijuana, recreational, like Colorado did, their fentanyl addiction, their, their deaths that they've had with fentanyl and drugs has spiked. Their addiction to drugs has spiked because you're opening up the door it's a gateway drug. And people could say, oh, Brian, you're overreacting. Smoking a little weed is not an, a gateway drug. Come on, man. People drink. What's so wrong? People drink, you know. Uh, you know, what's so wrong with that? That's legal. There is study after study that has shown that like, cities, counties, states that have opened up the door to recreational drug use has now have huge problems on the streets, huge problems uh, in their cities with these uh, with uh, unemployment, people on the street, drug rehab centers. It's bad. It's mm -hmm. bad for your society. There's a reason why. It was illegal. <laughs> it, it was illegal. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a reason why things are illegal. Uh, but the, what the left has done is they have pushed us to a point in our society that we have compromised what was once prohibited. We've now allowed it to be legal. And that goes this for the same thing for, you know, transgender and, and trying to do this to our children. They want it to be so common that we're just like, oh, well, that's the, that's the thing to do now, so we'll just get over it or meet in the middle, like you just said. Yeah. No, no, never no, not 50 years from now, no, 70 years from now, no. I'm still going to say, no, do not touch our children. Do not come after our children. Leave our children alone. If they're born a boy, they're a boy. If they're born a girl, you're a girl. And you know what? Brian, at the end of the day, you have XY chromosomes. And no matter what body parts you change and no matter what you, makeup you put on your face or if you want to wear pantyhose or high heels, whatever you want to do, you still have XY chromosomes. You're still a man. Yeah. You're still a woman. That's how you were born. Get over it. Get mad at me if you want. I don't care. That's the fact. I mean, we're not going to normalize transgenderism and, and especially when it comes to our children because that's just not normal it's not normal and it's never going to be you know i remember look i'm old okay i'm 53 um i remember growing up if you saw anyone that was like quote a cross dresser that's how they were described back yeah. in the day it was a cross dresser yeah. you know it was extremely rare like it yeah. was extremely rare that you met anybody that was a cross dresser uh, okay, then we entered the transgender era. Um, <laughs> I remember seeing a report from New York City that it was like 0.00001% of the people in New York State identified as, quote, transgender. Fast forward to 2023. 
I think one and two people <laughs> they they want you to think that everybody identifies as some type of alternative, uh, you know, uh, gender that they've, they've selected. So I, I don't know if that's the media. I don't know if that's just our cultures pushing it. If that agenda is pushing it, the LBGTQ uh, mafia, which what it is, because if you go against them, it's the mob. They actually turn against you. I mean, it's, I'm not a. I'm not scared of them. See, that's the thing. Not to go down the corporate woke path, but that's why a lot of corporations have bowed down to that community because they're absolutely scared of them, of them coming against them on a corporate level and forcing and, and suing them for whatever discrimination, which, you know, we hired the best people at a company, not based upon who they sleep with. That should be the number one priority. But, you know, I, I, I think that the numbers are inflated. It does not represent mainstream America. Not everybody is gay. Not everybody is transgender. Not everybody is, is transitioning into an opposite sex, despite what the media might think it's a big deal. It's not. It's, it's not. Yeah. Statistically, it's not. So we spend so much time like protecting like the point zero 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 one percentage yeah, of our people. The population. Yeah. And then we alienate everyone else in that and apparently every, everyone else are the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And the small percentage of our population are glorified and protected. It's wrong. It, it is, is absolutely well, like we said though, if you're nineteen, eighteen, if you're eighteen, nineteen, twenty, you want to do it, go do it. But if you're under eighteen it should be alone. illegal and a mm -hmm. felony. Vanessa Vusard, Brian Glenn, uh, live as we wait. Double box there. You can yes. see live look there in South Carolina. President Trump uh, really set to take the stage any minute now. Yeah, we're, we're ready we're for him. We're excited pretty. for it. It's the eve of the primary in South Carolina. Hey, if we haven't told you, I don't think we've mentioned it um, at all today. Uh, if you haven't followed us, look, we're going to... We're from the same town. If you ha didn't know that, I'm telling you that now. We're from the same town, Beaumont, Texas. We worked in media, mainstream media together, what, 17 years ago? It was time. a long time ago. And here we are again at Right Side Broadcasting Network working together. And I love working with Brian. And he's great. He's wonderful. The, the, the network is wonderful. We're going to be together a lot through November. So make I'm sure not sure you, you want to be with me that much. To Brian, be you're great. You. I love being with you. We, we have a great time you. together. <laughs> you haven't done it yet. I've been knowing well, you for good. a long time. That's why Christina Bob's not around. I think oh, I'm going to annoy her. Oh, no. no. Christina, I love her. She, I do, yeah. too. She's the sweetest. You know, uh, I can't wait to see her because, you know, we talk about not just pause that thought for yeah, just yeah, for a second. It. But she is such an expert on election integrity oh, actually, yes. and what's going on. So I do she miss Christina. She works for President Trump as an attorney. So yeah. that's her, her, her job. We'll and she does great. Yes. Um Make sure you're following us. We talk about Right Side Broadcasting Network, our newsletter, rsbnetwork.com. Sign up for our newsletter. Uh, download our app. A, a viewer just a minute ago stopped by, and he says, I love watching you, oh, but great. is there a better way other than, you know, just a website or the social media? I said, download our app. And in two seconds. That's what you did? Literally. I said, do you have it? He goes, I have it right here. It was that easy. It's free, user-friendly. And I, I, I told him it was nice to meet him, and I walked away and went on to the next person. But it happened like that. He pulled it up on his app store. He found it and he had it downloaded. So make sure you're following us. But I wanted to tell you too, make sure you're following us as well because there are some behind the scenes photos that I've been posting today that are fun, like with the gold MAGA hat, the 24 karat yeah. gold MAGA hat that we saw uh, debuted here at CPAC. Stuff like that you can see um, on the campaign trail as we're making our way across the country. So uh, for me on uh, Truth Social, I'm at Vanessa Broussard, spelled B R O U S S A R D. That is a million-dollar question with people. Brian, if you don't live in Texas or Louisiana, people don't know how to spell Broussard. Are you serious? Yes. Is that that much of a mystery Yes. Name? Broussard. I get it all. Oh, that's, but that's okay. It's Broussard, B-R-O-U-S-S-A-R-D. Follow me on Truth Social, Instagram, Vanessa Broussard News. I'm also on X. Uh, I, think I just thought of something. What's Alex that? Brusowitz. Yeah, that's a hard Broussard, one. Broussard, Yeah. I mean, it's almost like they have no problem saying Broussowitz, but they can't say Broussard. Yeah, yeah. And I, I love Alex well, Broussowitz, no, yeah, actually, by the way. I do, too. Yeah. But you know what? That's the first time I've heard that name, last name pronounced. I see him on social media, but of I've course. never pronounced Shout his last out to name, Alex Broussowitz. Broussowitz, if he's okay, watching. Okay, good to know. Your social uh, media. You, you should follow me at Brian Glenn TV yeah. across the board. Uh, and also, you can follow me at True Social at Brian B R I A N. That's easy. I need to be. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. Everyone at RSBN is at their first Do you know name, why? but me. Do you know why? Because you were the first one on. We we were there almost on day one. Um, 
day one when True Social launched. And I know, wasn't launched. with RSBN then. And so we yeah. were there when it launched. And so I got my name in there, and it was like, I lo- there's only one at Brian in the entire world on True Social. I'm trying to get at Vanessa to make yeah. it easy for everyone who can't spell Bruce Art, yeah. but that's okay. <laughs> uh, we were just told that everyone was announced to uh, find their seats here at that uh, event in in. Uh, South Carolina. So we are probably moments away between President Trump taking the stage. Once they start, once they start telling people to find their seats, we're getting close. I mean, business. We're getting Take close. Seats. President Trump is in the house. He is the man in the arena, as we like to call him. And so uh, he's in the in the back right there in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, waiting to talk to the crowd there at this special event. And in South Carolina, if you're watching, don't. Really pay attention to the polls. President Trump will say this: "Act like we're behind. Act like you know we're behind in the in the in the polling, and get out and vote. Do not expect everyone else to do it for you. Every vote counts. Every vote matters. So still, take the time tomorrow and head to your local polling location." Yeah. Okay. I've got a flight early tomorrow at eight o'clock to go to South Carolina. You're going to be here, and let's kind of unpack what's going to happen. Um, I'm not sure when we go on tomorrow. I want to say around 10 a.m. We'll let our guys Are look that up. Are you talking about up. here at CPAC? Yeah. Well, I'm seeing right here on the schedule, unless it's changed, someone in the back studio, let me know if this has changed. So this is showing 7.30 a.m. Eastern time. Okay, so 7.30, you're live here. With Grace. Sedona. With Grace. You've mm-hmm. got a, a ton of interviews. I mean, yes. tomorrow will be packed. But yes. Which, by the way, if you are coming out to CPAC tomorrow and you have not been the last two days, uh, be prepared because on Trump Day, the protocol to get in here is a little different than it is right now. Right now, it's pretty laxed. Mm -hmm. You can just, you know, walk on in, show your badge, you get in. Uh, That's not the case on when Trump's in town. So be prepared. Give yourself a little extra time to go through the magnetometers. Uh, I would imagine they have a couple set up. Yeah. So be prepared uh, for that. And of course, you'll have the pre show. I'll join you as soon as I can. I mean, Literally, as soon as I can, I can give you a report from the road. And then, of course, uh, I've been told I will be on the ground with Trump probably early afternoon. And we'll be back at um, Election Watch headquarters uh, by 6. So tomorrow night, back on the ground for that. We'll help you. Because you've got two shows tomorrow, Vanessa. Then you can go home for a little bit and we'll relax. take a nap before we'll Super Tuesday. Marty yes, little Marty's out. waiting for his mama back home in Texas. Uh, he's doing good, though. Yeah. Hello, Marty, if you're watching right now. I love you and miss you. Um, yes, so we have tomorrow night. It's going to be exciting and, uh, you know, really excited to see what uh, happens in South Carolina. And then, um, like I've been mentioning, early voting has already begun in the Super Tuesday states. So if you're one of those states, make sure you go out and vote as well. And Brian and I will be at Mar-a-Lago on March 5th. That's correct. For Super Tuesday. So Super we'll watch Tuesday. results come in with President Trump, and we hope you join us there yeah. that night as well. I like to see some good friends. I see a good friend of mine walking by right now. I'll leave him anonymous because he is out there shooting great pictures. So good to see you. And that's a good thing about CPAC is you see people that you've worked with. Uh, there, are, there are, you know, when you look at the political schedule, um, April, May, there are some primaries in those months. Um, but really by May, June, it's pretty much over. That, that goes into the main election. It should be. And that's when we're going to see. Now, what I want to see, this is what I'm hearing, that we could possibly have a rally in the Bronx, New York. Now, people that say, well, big deal, right? New York, big deal. Uh, That's a big deal. Uh, That's Madison Square Garden, possibly. And we could see um, about 20,000 people, if not more. And in New York City, in the Bronx, I mean, uh, that's huge. That is indicative of what we're seeing the President Trump's campaign doing right now, going into the heart of these major cities, you know, shaking it up, having Latinos for Trump come out here. You know, a, a group that you wouldn't traditionally think that would be so, you know, pro MAGA. If you look back, you know, eight years ago, six years ago, they weren't, you didn't, you didn't see that movement, but you do now. So this inner city, with every with urban uh, Americans, uh, it's becoming a force, and I think the Biden administration recognizes that 
you know what? This Every is, American yeah. is fed up. Yeah, they're fed up with this economic policy and this, uh, and this immigration policy. You know, I was looking at numbers the other night of how many illegal immigrants have crossed the country uh, in the Biden administration, and the number is so staggering in the millions that it is a population, I think it was like over 7 million people have crossed the border illegally since Biden took office, mm -hmm. a population that is more than 36 states. And I think... It disgusts me to even say this, that the Biden administration cares more about those people than the American people. That it's almost like they want more and more to come in so they can overpopulate us. Oh, that's, that's kind of what they want in a way. I would if you say. think 7 million people, that's a higher population than 36 states? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's safe to say that's what they want. I mean, yeah, I can't imagine. I'm, 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 I'm talking about, you know, all these people who love America. We've talked about it, you know. Whatever the race may be, the age may be, we talked about that just moments ago, Americans love their country, their freedom, those whose families came over here, migrated here the legal way, you know, a generation or two ago, and they see what happens in Cuba and all these, you know, communist countries, and they don't want that here in America. They want to save America. Are, are being told to toss to yes. Colombia as soon as possible? We are live here uh, in D.C. Let's toss to Colombia for... I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Unfortunately, I just saw Byron Donald's face on TV. Congressman Byron Donald has inquired about joining, but the CBC won't give him an answer. Cori Bush, she calls you a prop for upholding white supremacy. I do not believe that the idea was to make a diversity statement by nominating him. Sure enough, he's married to a white woman. I knew it. This is his mindset. This is white supremacy through ventriloquism. Those on the other side, they're the ones trying to tokenize him and say that the only reason he's successful is because of the color of his skin. See a black man rising, I mean, let the man rise, even if you don't agree with him. Specifically to my policies, I would argue that she should sit down and debate me one-on-one. -on -one. I think my colleagues, they recognize my leadership. Like, I've served before at the state level, now here at the federal level. You see, my mother, she taught me from a very young age that you just don't follow the crowd because that's what the crowd is doing. You think for yourself. You find the details. You make a decision, and then you live by that decision. And you have to stand on your own two feet as a man. Are you worried about retribution? Man, I'm 6'2", 275. I'm not worried about that. Seriously. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for the chairman of the Black Conservative Federation, U.S. Congressman Byron Donalds.
Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening, Columbia, South Carolina. First of all, look, this is a great event. This is a great evening. I want to thank you all for being here this evening. On behalf of the Board of Directors, thank you. Thank you for your support of the Black Conservative Federation. We have so much work in front of us. There are so many people in our country who are desiring true conservative leadership, and this organization is a part of delivering that to the United States of America. Before we get to the main event, I want to make sure that we thank all of the volunteers and all of the staff who made this evening possible. Because if you've ever been in one of these, in one of these galas and one of these events, it's not the guys like me up here talking to you now that did that work. It's everybody that made sure that the tables looked really nice and they looked beautiful. It's that everything was orderly coming in. Oh yeah. And it's the people who are going to make sure everybody exits orderly at the same time. By the way, Jack, is that you? Jack, stand up real quick, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Brewer is with us this evening. Love you. Love you, brother. I love you, brother. Love everything you're doing. Love you, my friend. I want to have come to the stage right now the founders of the Black Conservative Federation, Deontay Johnson and Quentin Jordan. Come on to the stage, y'all. As well as, you two come up quick. Because we got more, I got to introduce more people, so y'all come out. As well as my friend from this great state of Texas, Congressman Wesley Hunt. And last but not least, and this man has shown so much courage in the black conservative movement. When they tried to attack him, they tried to go at him, and he stood strong and he stood proud on his intellect, on his upbringing, and on his values. The secretary, Mr. Ben Carson. I was in Rock Hill earlier today, and I was with the 45th President of the United States. And let me tell you, Rock Hill was rocking. On the side of the arena, they say not Rock Hill, it's called Rock the Hill. And that's exactly what happened this afternoon in South Carolina. And there's a reason why that occurred. It, it occurred because our country is struggling. Our country is in decline. It's de in decline economically. It's in decline spiritually. It's in decline from a leadership perspective. It is in decline around the globe. And it is because we have a terrible person at the helm of our country in Joe Biden. But folks, we could reverse all that starting tomorrow in South Carolina. We can reverse all that on November 5th this year. We can bring real leadership back to our country. And listen, real leadership isn't always nice, but it's funny. Real leadership sometimes isn't cuddly, but it gets the job done. And when you have real leadership, our families, they can thrive. Our communities will thrive. Our states thrive. And this nation thrives. And we have a true opportunity, which doesn't come along very often in politics, to elect real leadership back to the White House. And that leadership is in the form of the 45th president, soon to be the 47th president, Donald J. Trump. the Black Conservative Federation. We made unbelievable strides for black Americans. But with your help, we're going to defeat Biden and the radical left. Ladies and 
gentlemen, please welcome the next president of the United States, President Donald J. Trump. And I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died, who gave that right to me. And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston, and New York to LA, where there's pride in every American heart, and it's time we stand and say. Thank you very much, everybody. That's really nice. Thank you. We love, we love you. Thank you very much. What a group standing right next to me. I'm honored to have you all with me. Ben, I've only known you. I don't want to say how long. It's too long. But you have done some job. The whole — I'm very proud to be with the five gentlemen up here. Very special. And we have a lot of special ladies and gentlemen in the audience that are my friends, and they have been for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. And I'm thrilled to be here tonight with Crooked Joe Biden's absolutely worst nightmare. Hundreds of proud, black, conservative American patriots. The worst nightmare. Together, we're part of the greatest political movement in the history of our country. It is the greatest movement, I think, without question, in the history of our country, and it's uh, done great things. And then we had a little interruption, but uh, the interruption is not going to last much longer. And we're going to have a tremendous victory. It's going to be even, I believe, greater and probably more important even than in 2016. That was now number one, but I think this is going to be something very, very special. Over the past eight years, we've energized the Republican Party. And we've expanded the Republican Party. You and I have made it bigger, better, and so much more interesting than ever before, and much more important than ever before. In 2020, we increased our share of black vote by 50 percent, 5-0. And we earned more votes from African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Asian Americans than any Republican in generations. This hasn't been you go back many, many decades, and uh, we're really honored by it. We're on track now to smash. You see what's happening. The polling's coming out, and they go, wait a minute, there must be a mistake here. They're saying, black people really like Trump. There must be a mistake. These guys know it's no mistake. They're saying, what's going on? We had one today, 28%. We had one at 31%. 
And, you know, I hate to say, when uh, I looked at Romney, does anybody know Romney? Didn't he get 4 percent? He got 4 percent and falling. And uh, we're, we're at a number that people are, frankly, if we were 28 percent, I don't even think we have to do the election. <laughs> they would just, I think they just, wouldn't they just sort of leave? They would leave. They'd just say, let's get out of town. Well, the getting is good because we're going to do great things for everybody, for all Americans. As one sign of just how great a job we've done, there are more black Republicans serving in the U.S. House of Representatives today than at any time since the 1870s. That's a long time ago. To me, that's a sign of progress. But the radical left Democrats in a cause, and it's a uh, it's a cause for panic for them. It's a nightmare hysteria and rampant outbreaks. They're suffering from a terminal case of Trump derangement syndrome. Have you all heard? They have Trump derangement. They are really not doing well. But, and they shouldn't be doing well, because honestly, they've done a lousy job for you. They've done a lousy job for you. They've been, done a lousy job for everybody. But for black Americans, they have done a very poor job every day. We are welcoming more black voters back home to the Republican Party. You remember the party of Lincoln, party of Lincoln, to help us reclaim the party of Frederick Douglass, party of Abraham Lincoln and other great people. We're delighted to have some of our party's most prominent leaders with us tonight, and they are really incredible leaders with incredible futures. And some of them, like Byron Donalds is so young. Wesley Hunt is so young. You guys are so young. Oh, I'd like to get a couple of years from them. <laughs> they're young and they're brilliant and they have an incredible, incredible future. They really do. I think they have an incredible future. Senator Tim Scott, he gave me his endorsement. He's been one of the best people we've ever had uh, involved with us. He's been unbelievable. He's a dynamo. And uh, he, uh, I heard what he said to you. He gave a speech today at Rock Hill. He tore the house down. He's better for me than he is for himself. You know that? Right? You know why? He's a good person. I don't mind speaking about myself. He doesn't like speaking about himself. He likes speaking about people that he thinks can do a great job. He's a special man. Where is Tim, by the way? Is he around here someplace? Because he was just back there. Uh, he's a very, very special guy. And another special man is Secretary Ben Carson. And, you know, we were running. Can I tell him our little, uh, little statement that you made to me in a church one day? Actually, you made it twice. You made it in a church and you made it just before a debate. But we're running. And he was doing very well, by the way. He was, he was knocking them dead. Everyone loved him. He was uh, tremendous religious support, evangelical support in particular. And he was going up, up, up. And I was up there. I came out and we would, I was doing really well. And I started to get a little bit nervous about Ben. He was going up a little too fast. I was not. A... <laughs> and he said to me, you have nothing to worry about. God put you in this position. You're going to win. We, I was running against him. He's the most competitive guy. But he said, you're going to win. God put you in this position. And I, I was confused because I'm ready to go into a debate stage. And he's doing so good. And he made that statement. And I always remembered that. And then he made a similar statement at the church. And uh, he's been a great friend of mine. He did a great job. No scandal. Remember, he was at HUD. Everybody at HUD has scandal. You know, and they get a little money for a department house approval someplace. No scandal whatsoever. HUD, you go check out HUD. Housing, urban development, you check it out. There's been a lot of problems over the years. There was nothing. He just ran a great operation with some very good people you had. You were right about all those people, and they were great. Thank you, Ben, very much. We appreciate the job you've done. And thanks also to Black Conservative Federation founders Deontay Johnson and Quinton Jordan. Fantastic people. Congressman Joe Wilson, you know, famous for uh, a remark he made years ago. Nobody will ever forget it. And we love this guy. He's a, he loves our country. A woman that I've known for a long time. I refuse to say how long, but I've known her for a long time. And uh, she's uh, really incredible. And she was 
she was very advanced. I mean, she understood what was happening long before most of the people in the room really did. Alveda King. Where is Alveda? Where is she? Thank you, Alveda. You really were. You know, you were a pioneer in the Republican Party, so to speak. She understood what was going on. Vice Chair of the California GOP, Corin Rankin. Thank you very much, Corin. Thank you very much. Great job. She's another one going places. A lot of people are going places in this room. Vice Chair of the Maryland GOP, Nicole Bennett. Thanks, Nicole. Great job you're doing, too. A friend of mine, somewhat controversial, but smart as hell, Vernon Jones. Where's Vernon? He's not even. Are you controversial, Vernon? No. Scott Turner. He did a fantastic job in the administration. Scott. Jack Brewer. These are great names that have done incredible work. Duke Tanner. Thank you, Duke. And I granted uh, clemency, a pardon, to Duke, and uh, he's gone on to do fantastic things. It's, it's interesting. I can endorse a person, and sometimes they're grateful and sometimes they're not. I mean, I you know, endorsed a few people that you probably read about. They weren't so grateful, were they, huh? What do you think? And not too much. They weren't too uh, grateful to me, right? And uh, they said, uh, will you run against the president? And he said, I have no comment. That wasn't good. That meant yes. But I did. I endorsed uh, a few people that weren't very grateful. But the one thing, when I gave pardons to people, every single person, I mean, I've never seen so, when they see me, they cry. It's such an incredible power of the president. And people that I felt were unfairly convicted of something, or maybe it was too long. We had a woman, a wonderful woman. We all know who that is. I won't even mention names. She was given 50 years in jail, 50. She served 22, 23. And uh, she had like 25 years left. I said, for what? And today it would be, they wouldn't, you know, it would be a reprimand what she did. And it's, it was so sad to see that. I let her out. I let a lot of people out, a lot of, lot of great people. But I've never had anybody that — I've never had anybody with a pardon. The endorsements, mostly good, but, you know, 10 percent of them uh, just, just really are not very appreciative. I wish I had them to do again. I would never give them. I would never give them. I would never give them, I'll tell you that much right now. The hell with those people. But when I pardon somebody, I've never had anybody get out and said, oh, I don't like him. I never liked him. I'd like to run against him. I'd like to do. They always, they see me and they literally start to cry. People with records and people that had some big problems. And they're cleaner than anybody else in the room. You know, when you give a pardon, they're expunged of everything. They're the cleanest people. I often say, this guy who had a rough life, is cleaner than anybody else in the room, all dilettantes, right? They say the cleanest. But it's something that I really appreciate. So uh, we appreciate some of the people that I gave pardons to are in this room. And we all know who you are. Or we, I know who you are. And uh, it was my honor. It was my honor. A man who I really like, and he's a hell of a pastor, I can tell you that. Pastor Mark Burns. Mark, where are you? Where's Mark Burns? He's. He's a great guy. Good. These lights are so bright in my eyes that I can't see too many people out there. But uh, I can only see the black ones. I can't see any white ones, you see? That's how far I've come. That's how far I've come. That's a long, that's a long way, isn't it? These eyes. <laughs> Uh, we've come a long way together. Lynn Patton, she's been incredible. Lynn Patton. And tonight's honorees, so deserving, Mary Milben and C.J. Pearson. So Mary and C.J., congratulations. That's unbelievable. With the help of many of you in this room, we are going to win the South Carolina primary tomorrow night. Hey, this is exciting. Stick around. We'll all get together, okay? And this November, we're going to defeat crooked Joe Biden. He's a crooked, corrupt, horribly incompetent president who's destroying our country. Other than that, I think he's quite a nice man. <laughs> no, you know, it's funny. Uh, I was talking uh, 
The steady, we had a big rally. We had a really, we had, we could have filled that arena. It's a 8,000 seat arena. We could have filled that thing three times. And uh, I said to the people, I didn't say this often, but I said, look, here's a story. I always respected the office of the president and the presidency so much. And I would never hit Biden very hard. But then he indicted me. He indicted me. I said, I can't believe it. I got indicted. I got impeached and we won them thanks to these couple of guys back here. But I got impeached, and Ben was helpful too, I will tell you. But I got impeached. I, that was a terrible thing. Should never happen. And it turned out I was right on the impeachment. The phone call turned out to be exactly right. They found the laptop from hell. It confirmed everything that I said. They actually go around now saying, you know, we shouldn't have impeached that guy. He was absolutely right. But we beat him twice. But I got indicted for nothing, for something that is nothing. They were doing it because it's election interference. And then I got indicted a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. And a lot of people said that that's why the black people like me, because they have been hurt so badly and discriminated against. And they actually viewed me as I'm being discriminated against. It's, it's been pretty amazing. But it possibly, I don't know, maybe there's something there. But I got also sued, and a lot of it comes right out. All of it comes out of the Justice Department, or it comes out of the Democrat Party. And it's a disgrace. This is like a third world country. And I say often, Alphonse Capone, I don't know if you know who Alphonse Capone is. This was the roughest, meanest gangster in history. I've been indicted more than Alphonse Capone, Scarface. <laughs> if he had dinner with you, and if he didn't like the tone of your voice, he would kill you that night. You would never see your family again. You were dead. I got indicted. My parents are looking down, say, how the hell did this happen to my son? I never heard the word, practically. But we're going to do something that's great for our country. We're going to make America great again for everybody, but we're going to make America great again also. And I'm not sure I can say necessarily again in this case for African-Americans. We're going to make America great for all of our country, but for African-Americans. And maybe, maybe we have to leave the word again out. You understand what I mean? Because Maybe there is no, again, we're going to make it great for you and great for everybody. And that's important. Our country has gone through hell. And in many cases, our country is in hell right now. And we're going to turn it around. We're going to turn it around fast for everybody. And I think you're going to be very happy. A big start tomorrow. We won, as you know, Iowa in a landslide. We won it by twice the record. We had the biggest margin ever times two. That's not bad. We, we did a number nobody thought. And in all cases, it's been higher than our expectations or anybody's expectations. We went to, as you know, New Hampshire, and we got more votes than anybody in the history of the New Hampshire primary. <laughs> then, then we went to Virgin Islands and Nevada. In Virgin Islands, we won all of the delegates. In Nevada, we only got 99.7 percent. We won. <laughs> So that's four. And I heard Nikki today. Nikki, Nikki, wonderful. I will never run against our president. He was a great president. Don't forget, she worked for me. But a lot of people don't realize I actually moved to there because I wanted to get Henry the governorship, if you want to know the truth. That was very important. And he's been a great, he's been a great governor. And Peggy, they've been a great couple. But that was a big, actually, it was a big factor. I said, well, if I move her over, she'll probably be okay, but we'll get a great governor for a state that I love. I've always won here. I won the primaries and I won the elections. We, we never had a loss here, Ben, right? We never had a loss. But uh, uh, so, Dickie, we're going to see how that all turns out. But we have a big deal tomorrow. And it's so important that everybody get out and vote because we want to win by big margins because the big day is November 5th. And we have to send a signal that we're coming. We have to send a signal. Our message to the black community in this election will be a very simple one. If you want strong borders, safe neighborhoods, rising wages, good jobs, great education, and the return of the American dream, then congratulations, you are a Republican. It's pretty simple. Joe Biden and the radical left have abandoned everything black Americans care about. They've, uh, they've really let you down. Look, we all understand it. They've thrown 
black Americans overboard, and it's been uh, not a pretty thing to watch. You take a look at some of these inner cities, but I and the Republican Party will fight for the black community like you have never had anybody fight for you before. And with me, you will never be taken for granted. You will never be taken for granted. They've taken you for granted. Do you ever notice they always come around about two months before an election? Then they get your votes, and then they go on and, you know, you, four years later, they come and say hello, or two years, depending on what office we're talking about. But they come back and they uh, do nothing. They do absolutely nothing until it's election time. Then they come and they, they uh, seek your vote. The future we want is one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And that's what we're doing and that's what we're going to happen. And Joe Biden is actually his incompetence, perhaps. But Joe Biden is a threat to democracy, a real threat to democracy. They're trying to turn that around. They're trying to say Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. No, no. When they do weaponization and when they do election interference like a third world country, they're really a threat to democracy. Under my administration, black Americans prospered like no time in the history of our country. We achieved the lowest African American unemployment rate ever recorded. That's a big stat. That's like, you know, Babe Ruth hit the most home runs or Barry Bonds. I don't know. Who the hell is it? What are we giving Barry Bonds? Any? Huh? It is, I'd see. You know, I know they put an asterisk. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. But there's something awfully nice. How many home runs did he hit, you know? Do we give it do we give it to Barry Bonds? Tell me. Do we give it to Barry Bonds or Babe Ruth? You gotta give it to Barry. Okay, I'm okay with that. Huh? Barry? Okay, I'm with I'm with Barry, hey. Especially tonight, I'm with Barry. I'm with Barry. In front of another group, I may be with the babe, but, but I, I don't. <laughs> but we also set record low unemployment rate among black young people. It was a record it ever. It was never anything like it before the China virus. You don't mind if I call it that. We want to be we want to be accurate. You know, it came out of China. It came out of China, right? 1.2 million African-Americans lifted themselves out of poverty on the strength of the Trump economy, the most in more than a century. Think of it. It's never happened like that before. Black Americans saw their largest increase in home ownership ever recorded. These are things that happened during this four-year period, Wesley, right? All of it. Uh, the black labor force participation rate reached its highest point in a generation with Senator Scott, Tim Scott, came to my office. I'll never forget it. I have an idea, he said. We created opportunity zones, which drove billions and billions of dollars in wealth to revitalize our most distressed communities, especially in the inner cities. I think it's the greatest economic development program maybe ever, and people don't talk about it. But that was done by Tim Scott, and then he came to see me, and we got it done, and it's been incredible. I got record funding for historically black colleges and universities. You know, the first year I saw like 45 guys came up. They're the heads of most, I think, guys, one wonderful woman, actually. They were the heads of the colleges. And I said, so what are you doing? They said, we come up every year to ask for help funding. And I said, all right. I didn't think much about it, but I got it for them. The second year, they came up and I said, what are you doing here? Well, we're back again. I said, you have to do this every year? They said, yeah, every year we come up. We never have funding, so we always come up and ask for funding. And one of them said, I feel like a beggar. I come up, I feel like a beggar. We do a good job with those incredible schools, but I feel like a beggar coming up. I said, ooh, that's tough. And sort of then forgot about it as we did. You know, I was focused on Russia, Russia, Russia hoax, and lots of other things, right? That we won, we won. There was no collusion. I could have told them that in, in the first minute, Ben. But the third year they came up, I said, okay, you're here to get money again, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. And they'd come over to the White House, and I got to know them a little bit, and they were fantastic. I, I tell you, in particular, like, I had some guys in there that were phenomenal people. And I said, you're looking for money again. I said, I have an idea. Why don't we get you a 10-year plan where you have all the money you want? Give me a number, and I'm going to add some more on to it. And I'll get it approved. And I got it approved. And we took care of these incredible people. And I said, the only bad thing is that 
I like you guys. I may never see you again. It was very sad, actually. I said goodbye to them, and actually, I've never seen them again. <laughs> they don't need me anymore. But Ben knows this. You remember that period of time. It wasn't that easy to get either. And I think a lot of the politicians in Washington use that as a lever to take advantage. In other words, every year they'd have to come up, and what are you going to give me now? They don't have to. <laughs> They don't have to kiss anybody's ass anymore, I can tell you that. So we took care of that. A lot of people don't know that. Everybody on stage knows it. And we'll invest more in a second term. We're going to take care of them. And uh, they, they really have. They've done a great job, and it's very tough. You're competing against schools that have billions and billions of dollars in endowments. And it's a tough, it's a tough deal, but they've done an incredible job. Under crooked Joe Biden, it's been nothing but cat it's really a catastrophe and a disaster. And you know it better. And I'm not saying this, and this is not, this is from the heart. It's been a disaster for black Americans. Biden gave you a three-year inflation rate of almost 39%. So over three years, didn't matter if you made a little bit more money. After inflation, you were way, way behind. The number of African-American families living in poverty has increased by more than 50 percent since the year one of his administration. Hard to say that his administration, because, you know, we got more votes than anybody in the history of a sitting president. We got millions more votes than we did in 2016. I was told by John McLaughlin and Fabrizio, the great pollsters, sir, if you can get 63 million votes, that's what we got in 16. There's no way you can be beaten. Well, we got like 75 million votes. I said, so I guess we didn't get beaten, yeah? But they said we got beaten. Now, we're going to be watching very closely. Look, we have, we have a country. We have a country that's got a lot of things going on. We have an open border. We have bad elections. We have very, very bad elections. You have to have honest elections and strong borders, or you don't have a country. You don't have a country. The average mortgage payment is now almost two times as high, costing the typical family an extra $19,000 a year in mortgage payments from when I was president. You and your family cannot afford four more years of Bidenomics. He thinks it's a good term. It's a really bad term. Anything having to do with his name is bad. That's why this November, black Americans are going to tell you all watch The Apprentice, right? They're going to tell Crooked Joe Biden, you're fired. You're fired. Get the hell out of here, you son. You're fired. Get out of here. You've been an incompetent, horrible president. You allowed wars to go that should have never happened. Israel should have never been attacked. Ukraine should have never been attacked. You're a lousy president. Worst president ever. The happiest person about him, though, and man who thinks very warmly of him, is Jimmy Carter, because Jimmy Carter is now considered a brilliant president by comparison to crooked Joe Biden. Jimmy Carter is a happy man. For Biden, wrecking the dreams of African Americans is nothing new. You know this. You know the real story behind this guy. I said, do I really want to say this stuff? But then I said, what the hell? I've been saying it. You know, when they said, oh, you can't run. You know, when you look at the presidency, it's such a cherished, incredible position, such responsibility. But 92 percent of the people were politicians and 8 percent were generals. So no percent were from where I came from. So they said, oh, he's just going to have a good time. You think I'm having a good time? I'm not sure it's a good time, but I love it. That's love it because we're going to make America great again. That's why I love it. But I said, do we really want to hit him that hard? Because if you do, you can really go back into history with him. It's the only thing he's really been good at his entire career. You know what that is? Being a racist because he's a racist. Crooked Joe backed NAFTA, which is a disaster for just a disaster. It's been a disaster for Hispanic Americans and for black Americans. China's entry into the World Trade Organization, where they just ripped us apart. I took in $472 billion from China. No other president has taken in anything. They did not want to see me do so well. You know, we're leading in every poll by a lot. You see it. 
and I don't think China's too happy about that, actually. The Trans-Pacific Partnership and every other globalist horror show that ripped the guts out of our country and pulverized black workers and owners of small businesses. So to any black voter who's thinking of casting your ballot for us uh, for the first time, it might be for the first time, and probably is, it's amazing. What's happened in the last two years is actually amazing. And it's been based on results, real results. Just remember, you owe crooked Joe Biden absolutely nothing. You don't owe him a thing, so do not feel guilty. Please do not feel guilty. The radical Democrat Party has waged war on black families for many, many decades. Think of it. It's really a hundred years. It's a century. They've controlled these cities for a hundred years. Hard to believe. I said, can't be. It is. They've controlled. And look at what you take a look at Baltimore. You take a look at New York. You take a look at Chicago. You take a look at all of these places. Take a look at what's going on in the West Coast. Take a look at what's happening. And they've controlled these cities for a hundred years. And nothing happens. Uh, they're slum areas. They're dangerous. Nothing has, nothing has happened. And we're going to change it. We're going to change it. Thank you. I like that guy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. What a voice. I love that guy. Who the hell is that? Is he a friend of yours? <laughs> yes. We're going to send him to the Met. So come join us in the Republican Party and never, ever look back. We're doing we're going to do it right. We're going to do it right. On top of everything else, Joe Biden really has proven to be a very nasty and vicious racist. He's been a racist. Whether you like it or don't like it, I happen not to like it. Most of the people in this room happen to not like it. And if somebody does like it, they're not supposed to be here. <laughs> Biden spent years palling around with notorious segregationists. You know that. He boasted that his home state was a slave state. He was very proud of that. He thought it was great. If you go back and look at his body language and the way he said it, he was very proud of it. He said that he didn't want his children to grow up in a, quote, racial jungle. I don't want my children in a racial jungle. Joe Biden drafted the 1994 crime bill, which caused unfair sentencing disparities that devastated the black community, black families. Cory Booker called Biden the architect of mass incarceration. Remember this. It was a time when Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden were talking about predators and super predators. You heard that. This is a hell of a lot more of a speech than you thought you were going to get, isn't it, huh? They thought it would be boring then, would make, uh, we'd give a little quick boring speech, but uh, we got it's called, let's tell it like it is, right? And then years later, <laughs> tell it like it is. Thank you very much. I just want to tell the truth. Remember, remember Howard Cosell? I just tell it like it is. <laughs> it ended up getting him fired, but these are mine. <laughs> and then years later, in an act of stolen valor, Crooked Joe had the nerve to falsely portray himself as a hero of the civil rights movement, which was such, which was so false. And then he said that if African Americans didn't vote for him, you ain't black. Now that one. <laughs> That one, you know, that one, that one's been so recent, I didn't even want to, but he did say that. A lot of people were surprised. He did say that, but that one's so recent, I didn't even want to put it in. We had to go back to the real stuff, but he did say that. I was a little surprised to see it. I'm sure you were too. Unlike racist Joe Biden, I've spent my entire life working hand in hand with black Americans to create jobs, build buildings invest in our communities and expand opportunity and freedom for citizens of every race, religion, color, and creed. And we have. I built a lot of buildings. And I want to tell you, a black worker is a great worker. You've done an incredible job. They've done an incredible job. Really talented, great people. 
And that goes for others, too. Hispanic is incredible. You know, the Hispanic numbers are, Ben, you know, they're through the roof. In Miami, we're leading in Florida with Hispanic. Along the Texas, they call it the, uh, the corridor, but they, it's, it's the line going between Mexico and Texas for a long way. We want every single community along the, uh, they call it the special line. We want every single community, and mostly, I think it's 88% Hispanic. It was a fantastic thing. Something that I'm so proud of. And it is really changing the Republican Party. The Republican Party has been a much bigger party. It's a much bigger, more inclusive party, and that's a fantastic thing. Yeah, no, it's, it's just, it's a fantastic, I'm very proud of it. Here's my promise to you as your president, I will go to work for you every single day. I will not quit until the American dream is alive and thriving for you and for every citizen in our land. And we put America first. You don't mind that. We put America first. Everywhere Joe Biden puts our citizens last, I will put you first. You will be first, and America will be first, and we're going to do things that nobody ever thought possible. Our country right now is being destroyed by people coming in that nobody has any idea where they come from. Think of it. They're coming in from prisons and jails. They're coming in from mental institutions and insane asylum. That's a mental institution on steroids, okay? They're coming in at a level that nobody's ever seen before. These guys have... It's the biggest thing. It's the, it's the biggest... So, when I ran in 2016, it was such a big thing, the border. That was peanuts compared to what we're talking about now. And I tell the story. I did such a good job on the border. Remember? They're coming in. They're racist. They're this. They're that. Uh, and they said, rapists, too. Rape. I called them everything. It's peanuts compared to what this turned out to be. And that was less... Those words were very inflammatory at the time. About three months later, they realized that the words were correct, except they weren't strong enough. It was actually the opposite. But we took this and we, we did a job with it. And then they couldn't, they wouldn't talk about it anymore. They didn't want to talk about it. But we, we're talking about it now because this makes what happened in 2016, it just pales by comparison. There's never been anything like this. This is an invasion of the United States of America. And they're taking your jobs. And they're taking Hispanic jobs, and they're taking union jobs. How about the unions? The unions, they work long and hard to get their wages up, and they have wages now, and people are going to be working for 15 percent and 20 percent of what people are getting now. And we don't want that. We don't want that. In some ways, it's good for an employer, but it's really bad for our people, and it's very unfair for our people. And we don't want that. We want people to come into our country, but we want them to come in legally through a process. And it is true. A lot of unions are looking and they're saying, what are we going to do? Because, you know, you're driving a truck and they do a great job, but you're driving a truck and somebody comes along and he's willing to do it for a tiny fraction of the cost. And those people are out of jobs. The unions are going to be in big trouble. And Biden's the one that's allowing him in. You know, he gave two and a half million work permits this year to people that are illegal immigrants. Two and a half million work permits. And those are, and those are people. And the bigger problem is, and you know, at the, uh, at Georgia, in Georgia, the University of Georgia, they had a horrible killing. I said, there's a new category of crime. It's called migrant crime. It's coming in at a level that nobody's ever seen before. And it's vicious. I call it Biden migrant crime. But it doesn't sound as good. No fairness. My, it does. It's too long. It's migrant crime. But just remember, he's the one that allowed this to happen by stupidity. Well, Biden wants to raise your taxes by $6 trillion. I will make the Trump tax cuts the largest tax cut in history. We'll make it permanent and give you the new economic boom. It's going to be an economic boom. When I was president, we slashed taxes for working families. We doubled the child tax credit, which, frankly, wasn't a Republican thing to do. But I said, we have to do it. I do things that aren't necessarily Republican. You know, I do what's right. And I do things based on common sense. Somebody said, you're a conservative. I said, no, I'm, I'm really a person of great common sense. We need borders. We need a strong military. We need good education. We need low interest rates. We want to be able to buy a house.
It's really based more on common sense, I think, than anything else. Who could allow what's happening? This is an invasion. Have you seen New York where hundreds of thousands of people are living on streets, are taking parks that the kids can no longer play? They're going into schools and taking schools. They don't speak a word of English, and they're sitting down in classrooms. Nobody knows what to do. It's a disaster that's happening, and that's happening all over the country as we supported moms and dads by dramatically expanding education savings accounts. I don't know if you've taken advantage of it, but it's a phenomenal thing. Under my leadership, the Republican Party will always support the creation of strong, thriving, healthy American families. And something that's very big in the news today through Alabama, you saw that decision. We want to make it easier for mothers and fathers to have babies, not harder for them to have babies. That includes supporting the availability of fertility treatments like IVF in every state in America. You saw what happened. It's become sort of a big story. I put out a statement, and so many politicians are calling me, thank you for that statement. I put it out on a thing called Truth Social. It's the hottest platform. It's also where I speak. It's, uh, it's hot, and it's, uh, it's truth. Everyone said, you'll never get the name Truth. I said, let's try it. Sir, don't bother. You're not going to. They wanted something with five letters, like tweet. I don't know. Is it a tweet anymore? I don't think so. You know, it's X. So what do you do? Say, so you're going to tweet? I don't know. They changed the name. I was sort of happy about that. But think of it. They said you, they had all these different names, these crazy names that nobody understood. And, you know, like uh, Zion, Zionening, Dodong, Tadang. <laughs> five letters. I said, ideally five letters. Like tweet is five letters. I said, uh, what about the word truth? Sir, you can't get that. There's no way you can ever buy that. That's uh, generic, and it's just that you're not going to be able to get it, I'm sure. So I said, well, have you checked? No, but I know you can't get it, sir. You know, these are wise guys. These are guys, you pay them a lot of money. They, they don't know what the hell they're doing. I said, do me a favor. I'm sure you can't get it. Try. <laughs> Try. So a uh, guy walks back into my office. 45 minutes later, he said, sir, you were right. We just bought the name Truth for $2,100. I would have paid millions. I would have paid millions. A guy had it. He said, man, I, and he probably got it for nothing and, you know, a long time ago. And he's happy. He's a very happy man. You know, he walked away with a couple of thousand bucks for doing nothing, having a name tied up. And we have the name and truth was born. That was a good, that was a good experience. But it just does tell you, always give it a shot. Never give up. If I wouldn't have said that, would have some name that nobody knows, has any idea what it means. Like the overwhelming majority of Americans, including the vast majority of Republicans, conservatives, Christians, and pro-life Americans, I strongly support the availability of IVF for couples who are trying to have a precious, beautiful little baby. They need, some people need help, right? You agree? If Wesley didn't agree, I'd probably have to take that back. But he agrees, because again, that's common sense. We want to help people. We want to help women. They need help in some cases. Today, I'm calling on the Alabama legislature to act quickly to find an immediate solution to preserve the availability of IVF in Alabama. The Republican Party should always be on the side of the miracle of life and the side of mothers, fathers, and their beautiful babies. And IVF is an important part of that. And our great Republican Party will always be with you in your quest for the ultimate joy in life, and that's to have a baby. So if we can help, we're going to help. Right? You do it, right? A lot of politicians were very happy because they didn't know how to respond to the decision that came down. Now they all know how to respond. I got so many thank you notes from big politicians. They said, thank you, sir because they didn't like what was, uh, what was happening, and now everybody's happy, and I believe that's exactly where it's going to be going. I, but they needed that little, well, maybe it's called leadership. I don't know what you'd call it. Maybe it's called just being intelligent. But that's what we want. We want to help the mothers. We want to help uh, people that want to have a baby that maybe otherwise would not be able to. I will stop the Biden inflation disaster, and we will, if you don't mind, drill, baby, drill. <laughs> Watch energy come way down. You know, the inflation was caused, I would say, would you say 
100 percent Byron or 99 percent by energy, right? He says 90. Yeah, it was just caused by energy. These guys came out, they stopped the drill, they stopped everything. Now they're going back to the drilling. Now they're going back to the Trump drilling because the election's coming up. But the day after that, if they should win, because if they win, the country's destroyed. I don't think our country will survive if they win this election. I think it's the most important election. I used to say it about 2016, and I meant it. But 2016 was nothing compared to what we're going through right now. We're laughed at all over the world. People think we're, they can't believe it. We're like, we've become a joke. We've become a joke. We're being laughed at. We have no, they don't respect our leader. How can you respect the guy? He can't put two sentences together. See the stage? We have three, four, four, five steps. We have all over the place. You have stairs. He can't find his way off a stage. Secret Service has to run up to the stage. He'll walk off the front. He has no idea where the hell he is. And he's negotiating with, he's negotiating with President, President Xi of China. So tough. There's nobody in Hollywood that could play his role. President Xi, you meet him, he goes, we must begin negotiation immediately. I said, let's talk. Can you chill out a little bit? Do you ever go to a ball game? <laughs> no, it's the first time I met him. I, he and I were great until COVID. And then I sort of like said, that's, that was just too much. But we had a great relationship. And uh, first time I met him, hello, how are you? We must begin negotiation. And they said, sure. I like that too. Actually, I respect it. You want to know the truth. In other words, he wants no bullshit. There's something that's okay. We don't, we don't have to talk about the weather. It's a wonderful day. Isn't it beautiful? How'd the Yankees do last night? Who cares? I will also pass the Trump Reciprocal Trade Act. That is, if China or any other country makes us pay a $100 or $200 percent tariff or tax, we will make them pay a reciprocal tariff or tax of 100 or 200 percent right back. And basically it's saying, and we don't have too many children in the room, and I'm sure most of them wouldn't be too offended by this, it's basically saying, you screw us and we're going to screw you back. That's all it's doing. We're saying if they charge us a tax, they charge us. If we build a car, if we send it to China, they have a massive tax. So therefore, it never gets sent. You don't have, you don't have American cars in China. And you don't have too many China cars here. You know why? Because I put a big tax, 27.5 percent, any car made in China. And therefore, our automobile companies are doing better. But you have other companies, you have other countries that are really playing that game very big. One of them is Mexico. A uh, deal was made, you know, they've taken 30 percent of our car business over the last 25 years. That's a lot. 32 percent to be exact. And they moved it to Mexico. And I was thinking seriously about putting a big tax that any car, any car made across the border, on the wrong side of the border, on the Mexico side of the border, going to put a big tariff on the car, like 30, 40, 50 percent. The car no longer has any viability. I'll say, come on over and hire our people and build your plant in the United States and you won't have any tax to pay, right? And we did a lot of that. We did it with different industries and we did really well. This will bring back millions of great paying manufacturing jobs and raise wages for workers of all backgrounds. The next pillar of our effort to earn the votes of African Americans will be an ironclad pledge to seal the border, stop the invasion, and send Joe Biden's illegal aliens back home. We have to do this. We have to do this. Have to do it. No country can, can sustain 18 million people, whatever it's, you can't sustain this. When, when you go to these cities and they're living in the middle of your best streets, they're living on people's lawns, they throw a tent or they just lie down. It's such a sad thing. I mean, on a human basis, it's tragic. They should have never let this happen. But there's no, no country can sustain this. And don't forget, generally speaking, they don't send their finest. I got to know most of the leaders like in South America. They come from all over the world. But you think of South America, but they come from all over. But I got to know them. They're very cunning people. They're street smart people. Our guy's not street smart. Our guy doesn't have it. You know? <laughs> what are you going to do? 
Remember I said that about Chris Christie? You, you're not allowed to use the word fat. You know that. You're not allowed to call <laughs> You're not allowed to call somebody fat. It's politically incorrect, okay? So I was with, you know, this guy has Trump derangement syndrome like nobody. How's he doing lately, by the way? Uh, he's, he's got Trump derangement syndrome at, I would say, a terminal level. And some guy, some guy shouts out in the audience, he's a fat pig, but nobody heard him. He was very quiet. Right? Nobody heard him. He was in the front row. He said, Sir, he's a fat pig. And I said, okay, listen, you, stand up, please. The guy stands up, big, strong guy. I said, you cannot call Chris Christie a fat pig. You, just don't do that. You can call him a pig, but not a fat pig. You're not allowed to use, so never, please, I'll, I'm going to have to have you removed from this room. You cannot call him a fat pig. I said that about 12 times to the guy during the night. <laughs> So anyway, no, but it's one of those things. Well, he just did. He just said something that was sort of cool back there, but we won't repeat it. No one is a really is hit harder than uh, the people in this room, the black workers, the Hispanic workers, people that have good jobs. They're going to be decimated. Everything is going to be changed. The world is going to be changed because of all these people pouring into our country. And you have to understand, though, the leaders of these countries, they are street smart. They're not sending their hard-working, good, you know, they're sending people. That's why they're sending them out of their prisons. Prisons in various countries that you know very well are empty. They used to be full. Remember the pictures two years ago where they're so crowded? Oh, it, it was hell. But these are rough guys, too. These are rough, rough, tough guys. Uh, you look at MS-13, probably the roughest gang in the world. I mean, they cut people up for fun. They don't like using guns because it's not painful enough. These, remember, they attacked the two girls in Long Island going to school, and they cut them up into little pieces. And these people are coming into our country. They're, they're nasty and tough and horrible. But those countries keep their people the people that they want. They send us the people that they don't want. That, oh, that is not just people from prisons. That is not just people from mental institutions and terrorists. It's other people also. Uh, they are trying to keep the people that have made their country, whatever it may be, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. Their wages will be cut in half. Your wages will be cut. The black worker, their wages are going to be cut in half, but much more, I believe, much more than that. And ultimately, their jobs are going to be gone. They're going to be given to other people. It's a bigger problem than anybody understands. Just like I was saying a year ago, you know, I don't want to be bragging, but there was a hat that was made about two years ago. It said Trump was right about everything. And it was a big, I was right about everything. I'm telling you, <laughs> I was right about everything. And what's happening now is, is something I said, if you allow these massive numbers of illegals in, you're going to have a crime wave, the likes of which has never been seen. It's now starting. I'm surprised it took as long as it took. But you're having a crime wave now, a different crime wave. But you're having a crime wave the likes of what has never been seen before in this country. I just can't believe it took a couple of years. I guess they were getting comfortable in the country. And then they said, all right, now it's okay to start beating up policemen. But uh, the crime wave is really big. It's migrant crime. It's really big. It's a terrible thing. And you add that to the crime that was already very high. Uh, this administration has been a disaster. Joe Biden has already given work permits, as I said, for 2.5 million illegal aliens to complete the total betrayal of black Americans. It's a betrayal. You're not going to be able to get jobs. We got all these people, and they'll work for practically free. And, you know, it's just you're, you're going to lose your jobs. And meanwhile, migrants are being dumped in predominantly black communities. You know that. Look at what's happening in Chicago. I watched women specifically some incredible women they're like mothers they're people they love their neighborhood they're you know they have pictures and names of their neighborhood they're saying we don't know what to do these people are coming in we don't know what to do and the city is giving all of the money to them they're not giving any money to anybody else they're giving hotel rooms they're staying in luxury hotels and our veterans are blacks and our hispanics and our asians are living on the streets with nothing. It's crazy. It's crazy. 
He's flooding our towns with foreign gangs and deadly drugs. Drugs are pouring into our country. But these women, I don't know, and for some reason it seems to be in Chicago, in particular, the way they, they have a group. It's just wonderful, beautiful black women that are saying, what are you doing to us? You're destroying our way of life. That's going to be that way all over the country. It's going to be that way all over the country. On day one, I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration, and we will begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. We will also act to swiftly crush the wave of violent crime. And you know, uh, these people come from some pretty tough countries, and I said it before. They couldn't do what they do here. You know, you saw the middle finger going out to our police the other day. If that happened in their country, they'd be, they'd be dead within two minutes. They'd be dead. Uh, they took them a little while to realize that we're politically correct or politically wrong, in my opinion, but uh, it took them a little while. But if they went in, you go into some of these South American countries where they have the guys with the bullets across that, you know, Pancho Villa, right? Boom, boom. They got more bullets. You got to be strong just to carry the ammunition. And I got 28,000 of them to protect our border. Don't forget, I told Mexico, you have to give us 28,000 soldiers. The president of Mexico laughed at me. He said, why would we do that? What are you crazy? We're not going to give you. I said, yes, you 100 percent. No, 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 we won't. We won't. You know that story. Did anybody hear that story? We won't. We won't. And I said, no, no, you will. You have to give us 28,000 soldiers. We're building the wall. We built 571 miles of wall. We're going to do another 200 miles of wall. We had it built. And then when Biden came in, all you had to do was going to take three weeks. It would have been erected 200 extra miles, far more than I said during the campaign that I was going to build. But I said to Mexico, you have to give us soldiers because they're coming through your country in numbers that nobody's ever seen. And the president said, no. I said, listen, you're my friend. I like the guy. I said, you're my friend. Send somebody to negotiate with me. So they sent this gentleman over, a very handsome guy, tall, beautiful looking guy. And I said, uh, I want 28,000 soldiers guarding our border and I'm not going to pay. And they said, uh, <laughs> we're not going to do that. We had a woman from the State Department who was a very nice woman. She worked on Mexico exclusively for 25 years. I said, give me the top 10 things that you want. I'll get all 10 of them. They said, uh, she said, sir, you're, not, you're wasting your time. We've been after this for 20 years, like catch and release in Mexico, like remain in Mexico, like your title where you have sick people not allowed into our country because they will, they will give disease to other people that would never have happened. You have a lot of very sick people, and we all have a heart. We want to take care of the people. But we can't have them come into our country and infect our country. And all of these things, I had 10 things. I went to Tom Homan, who you know, he's a tough guy. I went to a couple of other, Brandon Judd, great people, and they're very strong. Our border was the strongest it ever was. I said to him, no, no, you're going to give it to me. No, he said, I'm not going to give you 28,000 soldiers. I'm not authorized to do that. I said, I promise you, you're going to give it. Now, you're going to give us 28,000 soldiers, and we're not going to pay for them. And they're going to go from east to west, or west to east. I'll take it either way. And you're going to give us 28,000? No, no, no. He says, no way. I said, way, way. And he said, no. And then I said to him, here's the story. You're going to give us the 28,000 soldiers. We're not going to pay. And if you're not... We're going to put a 25 percent tariff on every car that you have made that you stole out of America. We're going to give you a 25 percent tariff. Every single car and every product that's made in Mexico that comes into the United States is going to have a 25 percent tariff placed on it. And if you're not going to give us the soldiers, it goes into effect on Monday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning. It was a Friday. And he said, uh, sir, you know, you ever see a guy choke like over a putt or over a pitch by a guy that throws a ball at 100 miles. It's like, oh. And uh, you could see he was a little choky. He was getting a little bit choky. May I have five minutes, I said, to call the president of Mexico? Yes, sir, to call the... He comes back in in about three minutes. He goes, we would be delighted to provide you with 28,000. And we had... That's why we had the lowest numbers, the best numbers in the history of the border, the history of our country, by far. We also did two other things. Drugs were down 57%. Now, 
drugs are 10 times higher than at any time. The drugs are pouring into our country. There's nobody to stop them. It's not just people. In human trafficking, and it's almost always with women, it's women. And you think of it almost as an ancient crime. You know, when you hear human trafficking, you don't think about it as today in this world. Well, it's worse today than it was a thousand years ago. And the reason is because of the computer, because of the Internet. They search the Internet for women and they grab them. It's an unbelievable, horrible thing. And it's big business. It's getting to be as big as the drug business. And we're going to stop these people. We're not going to do it. We did a better job on that than anybody's ever done. We had it because it was very hard to get them in. They'd have women put in trunks of cars. It was vicious, vicious. And we had it largely. We had a big portion of it stopped. I mean, these are violent people, very smart, but violent, violent, streetwise people. And we had so much stopped, and we did such a good thing. And then when he took over, he let it all expire. The person from the White House, from the uh, Secretary of State's office, from State Department, she couldn't believe it. She said, you got every one of the 10 things we've been trying for 25 years. You got every I said, I told you. I got every single one. I got things remain in Mexico. That was a big thing. When you come up, if you want to come through Mexico, that's okay. But you're going to remain in Mexico until you're approved to come in, of which a very small portion got approved, like about 4%. But you are going to remain in Mexico. You had to see Tijuana. You had to see some. They, they became like one of the biggest cities. It was a mess. I said, they can't come into our country. We did such a good job. If Joe Biden, you know, somebody told him he looks great in a bathing suit. Now, he's 81 years old. And I don't know. I'm not sure that Cary Grant, do you know Cary Grant? He was this very handsome guy. I'm going to put it more in this. Sidney Poitier, I thought he was very handsome, right? When he was 81, I'm not sure he looked great in a bathing suit. I don't know if anybody looks too great in a bathing suit at 81. What do you think? Maybe these guys look good in a bathing suit. But if he would have, he was told by his genius political consultant, some genius that probably gets a million dollars a day, Sir, you look great in a bathing suit. Go to the beach. Remember, he couldn't lift the chair. You know what the chair weighs? Like about three ounces. It's made of aluminum. <laughs> it's meant for child, children, young children that are four years old to be able to lift them for their grandfather. <laughs> Remember, he, he gets the chair, and, oh, and then he can't lift his feet out of the sand. And somebody was saying that uh, this is a good look. It's not a good look. <laughs> And it's also not a good look to be at a beach on a Tuesday and a Wednesday and a Thursday. You know, maybe Saturday and Sunday, Ben. But, you know, when you got a guy that can't get his feet out of the sand, he's falling over. He can't lift the chair. And uh, it was a pathetic sight, actually. And all he had to do, but if he went to the beach and left the border alone, just left it alone, he would have the greatest border that we've ever had. But because I did it, they dismantled everything. They dismantled stay in Mexico. Think of it. Remain in Mexico was such a big thing. It was a big deal. To get that from Mexico, by the way, Mr. President, I want you to uh, have everybody remain in your country. Do you think that's easy to say to a guy? That's why they laughed at me. When I first went there, I said, yeah, we want remain in Mexico. We want this. We want that. But the big thing, 28,000. We want 28,000 soldiers. And they laughed at me. They said, this guy must be stupid. This, how could he ask for something so ridiculous? Within 10 minutes, they were agreeing to everything, you know? You got to have the people that know how to sell. And if they don't know how to sell, you got the wrong people. She worked 25 years. She was a good woman, by the way. But she worked 25 years, she got nothing. I worked 10 minutes, I got the whole damn thing. You take... I'll give you another example. I'll give you another example. In France, the leader, Macron, right? You know that, right? So I was told, I was told, and they're very, you know, they're very difficult, actually. And uh, I was told very strongly that they're going to put a big tax on our companies doing business in France. Emmanuel, Emmanuel. And they were going to put a massive 25% tax on American companies doing business in France. Why? You know? We don't want that. Why is that? We don't do it to them. So I called up my Treasury Department. I said, go and negotiate and tell them if they put the tax on. We're not going to be happy. They did. They came back a week later. They said, they won't do anything, sir. It's been passed by the legislature. So I, don't, I said, I don't care if it was passed by 10 legislatures. Tell them we're not going to take it. I said, you got two more days. Come back. They came back. They didn't bring the turkey. So 
I said, watch. Watch a grown-up do it. These are all geniuses. They're all smart guys. Spectacles, nice spectacles. You know, brilliant guys. All brilliant. They can't do crap. So what I did, I called up. I said, get me Emmanuel Macron, please. Emmanuel! How are you? Oh, Donald, Donald, I miss you so much. We must have dinner. I said, yeah, but first we have to settle a problem. Look, you have a... You've instituted a big tax on American companies, 25%. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, we have done that. Oh, and uh, yes, it's been fully approved. Thank you very much. It's already in effect. I said, here's the story, Emmanuel, take it off. Well, I won't be able to do that. This was approved by the legislature. That's okay. You are the legislature. Here's what you do. Take it off fast. Because if you don't take it off, I'm going to put a 100% frickin' tariff on every bottle of wine and every bottle of champagne that comes into the United States from France. No, 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 Donald, you cannot do that. That would be very unfair. I said, no, unfair is what you're doing to American Cup. Within about three minutes, he said, may I get back to you? I said, yes, but you got to do it fast because it's ready to be instituted. I have it in front of me right now. I'm going to sign it. He calls me back in about three minutes. Donald, we have decided to remove the tax. We will not be charging American companies. And that was the end of that. Is that good? Is that a good story? I mean, you know, these are stories. I could give you more of those crazy stories. I got so many of those. I, would, I kept you out of war with that same kind of stuff. You didn't have any wars. We defeated ISIS. We killed Soleimani. We killed al-Baghdadi. We knocked the hell out of ISIS. Don't forget, ISIS, I was told by our generals, the television generals, we have great generals, by the way. Great. We have a great military, but not the guys that are on television. Not, not Millie. He says, you beat me. He actually beat me. Too. Not Millie. Not others, I won't say. But, the, you know, you get to know them after a while. But we have great warriors in there. Uh, Raisin Kane, right? What's your name? Sir, my name is Kane. What's your first name? Raisin, sir. I said, wait a minute. Your name is Raisin Kane. Yes, sir. That's what they call me. Ra I love you, General. I've been looking for you for a long time. And he beat the crap out of them. He, what he did was unbelievable. He knocked them out in six weeks. I was told it was going to take four years. I met him. I flew to Iraq. And I actually met I landed in Air Force One, had to turn off all the lights. After 20 years, you still couldn't have the lights of a plane on. We landed on the runway. Maybe you heard the story, I told it a couple of times. We landed on the runway, sir. They said, sir, we're getting ready to land. We're about an hour out. Uh, could you please have all the lights turned off in your cabin? I said, why? Because we don't want anybody to see us. So we spend a trillion dollars, and we have to turn the lights off because we're going to be shot down think of it how crazy i said can you imagine i'm spending and i'm they're pulling down the shades and turning off not only pulling down the shades pulling down the shades and so the plane is totally dark inside no lights on the wings nothing everything's out and they're flying and so what i did is i went up and i said uh i want to see the captain i want to fly in with him because i love doing that i love this great equipment although the plane's 32 years old i ordered new ones and i saved 1.7 billion dollars from what obama was willing to pay i have to tell you Black president, but I got 1.7 billion less. <laughs> Would you rather have the black president or the white president who got 1.7 billion off the price? I think they want the white guy right now. You got 1.7 billion off the price. I said, no, no, no. I said, we're not doing it. No, no, no. I kept saying no to Boeing and the price kept coming down for this exact same plane. Anyway, so. I went up to the cabin, and the captain said, this captain, better looking than Tom Cruise. I was going to say and taller, but I don't want to say that because I got myself in trouble. A perfect looking, like a male model, everything perfect. You know, they put the best people flying the president, which probably makes sense, the helicopters and the planes. Yes, sir, it's a great honor to have you in the cabin with us, sir. They had four guys that looked like the most handsome human beings I've ever seen. He said, sir, we'll be landing in 20 minutes, sir. And I, I don't know if anybody has ever been in a cabin of a very sophisticated commercial plane, one of the great planes. And uh, you, it's all computer uh, operated, the sounds and everything. They have a voice. And when you get 100 feet or 1,000 feet, it says 1,000. And it's a computer voice, but it's, you wish you could speak that way. So it goes 1,000. And I'm having a problem because I don't see any lights, and he's telling me we're about ready to land, and I'm looking out for it. And I've, see, I've been in a lot of planes. I love, you know, the whole feel of sitting up front. It's like you're in a bird. 
and I'm watching. And I have these guys there. They're perfect. They're cool as cucumbers. The two captains. I've never seen so many people in a plane. They're five telephone operators. They say, how many calls can I make? You know, but they have guys. If I want to call China, sir, I take care of China. I take care of this. This is uh, serious. This is like the real deal. So anyway, so I'm walking up. And I say, Captain, are we okay? Uh, <clears throat> talk about choking. I'm going, <clears throat> Are we okay, Captain? Is everything all right? I don't see any lights up there, Captain. He goes, sir, we're fine, sir. And then you hear 1,000. That means we're 1,000 feet over there. That's not much. That's like, that's like a building. And this plane's very big. And there is absolutely nothing on the ground, and there's nothing in the plane. It's totally dark, other than a little tiny light up front so they can see a little bit. And I said, uh, Captain, Okay. You sure everything's okay? Would you like to go back? Let's go back to America. Then forget, I want to go to Iraq to find out why the hell we couldn't beat ISIS. And I did this. We left at 3 o'clock in the morning from the White House. Everything was very top secret. Nobody knew I was going. It was a big surprise when I ended up there. In fact, they said they think Trump's on vacation. No, that's Biden that's on vacation all the time. <laughs> Which I took more vacations than any human being in history, I think. He set the record in history, not just for a president. He's on vacation right now. Whenever there's a problem, he's in one of his many homes. If he get that one out, he made 179000 was his top salary. He's got homes all over the place. So we're in there. It says 1,900, 800, 700, 600. That means 600 feet. That's very close to Earth. And underneath is desert. Not a light. 500. Captain, are we okay? Is everything... You know, <laughs> is everything okay, Captain? Yes, sir. No problem, sir. We'll be landing in 30 seconds, sir. 400. 300, 200. Ay, ay, ay. Oh. So now we're like 200 feet off the ground. This massive airplane, the wheels are down. 100. There's not a light in the runway. You know the way runways are all lit up, right? We know it. They're all lit up like, like flash bulbs. There's not a light in the runway. And then boom, boom. We land so beautifully, like perfect. And I said to the captain, thank you, captain. I'm walking out of there. Man. <laughs> then I went. I said, great job, captain. Yes, sir. That was a great honor to have you, sir. Great honor, sir. And I'm walking out like, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> so this is all fact. So now I'm in Iraq and I'm, uh, I'm going down and I see my people and I say, let me ask you a question. Does the president of the United States have the right to give himself the Congressional Medal of Honor? Because, <laughs> because I feel I was extremely brave in sitting in that cabinet. They said, sir, we don't think that's a good idea. I said, okay. See, now I'll show you how dishonest the press is. If that's press back there. Here's the headline tomorrow. Donald Trump wanted to give himself the Congressional Medal of Honor. So, right? They'll, that's why you can never be sort of cute and jokey. And You know, when I imitate Biden, because he can't find his way off the stage, as you all know. He makes a speech that lasts usually about a minute and a half because the octane starts to wear off at a quick rate. <laughs> You ever notice he starts off strong? Within about two minutes, he can't talk anymore. And then he walks off. You ever notice he always goes like this? <laughs> then he comes back up to the mic. And he's looking. He's totally lost. There's stairs all over the place. He can go there, there, here. He could jump off the front of the damn plot. But he always... He always goes like this. And then, there's a stair right there, right? Then he starts. And then, and then Secret Service by the way, Secret Service, but they are, they're incredible people. So one of these beautiful, handsome, smart, intelligent, you know, with far greater IQ than he had when he, when he was 45. 
They're much smarter than he. You know, it's always lousy when Secret Service is smarter than the president, okay? So, but the Secret Service always runs up, grabs him, and leads him off the stage. And we say, this is our president, right? But here's the problem with that. Like I'll sometimes say, Barack Hussein Obama is the president of our country. And they'll say, Donald Trump didn't know who the president was. What I'm saying is, Obama's calling the shots, perhaps. But when I say that, so it's very dangerous for me to do this. When I say, when I do the walk, my wife, I said, how did I do? Good, honey, but you couldn't find your way off the stage. What happens? I said, what the hell? They say that Donald Trump couldn't find his way off. They know it's not true. So I don't do too much imitation of that anymore. I don't do it. But since, do we have a good time? What the hell? Right? No, it's true. No, being, being sarcastic, I interchange names all the time. Every time I interchange a name, and I do it in sarcasm, every time I interchange a name, they say, Donald Trump didn't know this one from that one. I know exactly what the hell I'm... Don't forget, I'm up here now rapping to you guys for 45 minutes without any notes because this stupid teleprompter wasn't working. So I could say, like Biden, he'd go like this if the teleprompter... You know, sometimes, no matter how good the equipment, they don't work, right? So if Biden lost the teleprompter, first of all, he's no good with the teleprompter anyway, even when it does work. How about when he takes questions from the press? He goes, he has notes. Because when I was in the White House, remember, I used to get these tremendous skirmishes. I'd scream and I had that idiot from CNN. I had it all. And we won. We did win. I had a lot of fun. But think of this. Uh... Uh, Jim from N NBC. And he's like, uh, yeah, yes, yes. Mr. President, uh, what's your favorite color of the ice cream and flavor of the ice cream? Uh, okay. Then he picks up a card and he reads the answer. My favorite color is black. But my favorite ice cream is vanilla. Yeah. So think of it. The press asks him questions. They ask him questions and he reads the answers. That never happened to you. Did that ever happen to you? No, they, re they ream us, right, with questions, but it never happened with us. But since Biden took office, over 29 major cities have seen a 30% increase in murders, or higher. They've never had a crime wave like this in the country. It's going to get much worse because of migrant crime. Last year, Washington, D.C. had the highest number of murders in 26 years. We have a capital where people are afraid to go there now. They're getting murdered. They go there from South Carolina. They go there from different places and they come home in a box. No one has suffered more than black Americans from the pro-crime agenda of white liberals. Most of the violent crimes in these cities are committed by a small handful of dangerous repeat offenders, many of whom have been set loose by Marxist prosecutors. They don't want to go after them. And radical district attorneys who are too focused on locking up Republicans say they do. They really, I have more people after my ass than anybody. I think I don't think there's ever been a criminal. The worst criminal in history has not had the kind of attention that I've had. And that's weaponization. That's trying to inflict pain on your political opponent. We've never had that before in this country. You do have it a lot in third world nations, but we are becoming a third world nation. Like citizens of all backgrounds, black Americans want to live in safety. And that is what I will deliver as your president. You want safety more than anybody else. You want safety. You want to be able to go get a, a loaf of bread and not be shot. I will bring back the rule of law in America and your community will be safe. I promise you that as president, I gave our police officers the support and the resources to do their jobs and to do their jobs properly. We did a great job with that and crime was way down. We also passed groundbreaking criminal justice reform. We wanted that. And nobody wanted it more than our great black citizens. They wanted it. They came to my office. We had uh, a tremendous guy named Van Jones. You know Van Jones? He works for CNN, so nobody watches. But. 
He came to my office along with a few other people. He was brought in by my very brilliant son-in-law, Jared, who's probably liberal, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> a brilliant student from Harvard, probably liberal. But anyway, he says, Van Jones would like to see you and a couple of others. I said, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of Van Jones. He said, no, no, it's so good. It's criminal justice reform. Van Jones comes in. He said, sir, you're the only, we're five votes short. You're the only man that can get criminal justice reform done. We're five votes short, sir. We need to get some conservative senators. You think that's easy to get? No. And I said, so tell me about it. And he, he breaks down and he starts crying. And I thought it was a beautiful thing. I mean, it meant to me that he meant a lot. And he was crying like a baby in the office, saying, I, we need your help, sir. It's not going to happen. We were so close, but we're five votes short in the Senate. And I said, so tell me about criminal justice reform. And he said, it's something that the black community feels very, very strongly about. And I said, let me look into it. And he left. But the, the guy was, uh, he broke down, totally broke down in my office. And I called up some guys, and uh, one of them said, oh, you're calling about criminal justice. I don't want to do it, sir, but if you want it, I'll do it. I said, I really, I'd appreciate you, but I called up another one. And then actually we had a couple of conservative guys that actually wanted it, right? We had some conservative uh, senators and congresspeople, very conservative, some of the most conservative. Actually, had the, the biggest liberals and the biggest conservatives. But I called up a couple, but I had to really twist arms, as they say in the world of politics. And... I got it done. Nobody else could have done it but me. Obama tried, he couldn't do it. Bush tried, he couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. I got it done. And it was a big deal and everybody was happy. And they had a big celebration and they had a news conference. And Van Jones was there with about 15 or 16 people. I called my wife, our great first lady, who says hello to you. She loves you, by the way. I called our great first lady and I said, Honey, I did something really good. Watch. Watch this, because the man is right there that I did it for. And uh, he broke down in my office. He really wanted it. It was very beautiful to watch. He wanted it really for the black population. It's a very important thing. You know, uh, you've been trying to get criminal justice reform for 60 years, where people are put, like some of our friends, they're given 50, 60-year jail terms for something that they should be given almost no jail term. And it's a, it was a serious problem. But I said, baby, watch this. It's going to be beautiful. He's going to say great things about me. I love that. Look, I don't care who you are. If you're watching television and somebody's on, if they say nice things about you, you tend to like them. <laughs> or you tend to at least want to watch. We can all be cool. I don't care. I, no, if you're, but I said, watch this, honey. It's really important. What we did is something really special. Nobody else could have done it but me. I'm the only one who could have done it. <laughs> and so watch how nicely he'll recognize me. So he gets up. He goes, today we got criminal justice reform. I want to thank Reverend Al Sharpton. He had nothing to do with it. <laughs> he, no, he said, I want to thank Jim Jones. I want to thank Jim Smith. I want to thank... Irving Schwartz, I want to thank this, I want to thank that, I want to thank this, he's reading a list. He never mentioned my name. And I say, Van Jones, someday I'm going to get you, Van Jones. <laughs> it's true. You know that? He never mentioned my name. My wife said, congratulations, darling, great job you did. <laughs> then he never mentioned my name. And I thought that was terrible. And you can't do that stuff, you know, you can't play those games. Black conservatives understand better than most that some of the greatest evils in our nation's history have come from corrupt systems that try to target and subjugate others to deny them their freedom and to deny them their rights. You understand that. I think that's why the black people are so much on my side now, because they see what's happening to me happens to them. Does that make sense? I've heard that. When I did the mugshot in Atlanta, you know that mugshot is number one. Elvis Presley is Elvis Presley's number two, and Frank Sinatra is they, they had Frank Sinatra for fighting, and they had Elvis for, I don't know, something in a gas station. He tried to hold up a gas station. I don't know. Something like Elvis. So Elvis is number two, but he was always number one. My, my, the mugshot, we've all seen the mugshot. And 
You know who embraced it more than anybody else? The black population. It's incredible. You see black people walking around with my mugshot. You know, they do shirts and they sell them for $19 a piece. It's pretty amazing. Millions. By the way, millions of these things have been sold. So I don't know if I'm proud of it or not proud of it. But anytime you can beat Elvis, that's okay, right? Over the past few years, millions of Republicans have woken up to the dangers of weaponized power in our government and our justice system, and no one knows about that better than me. When I return to the White House, I will have no higher priority than to restore fair, equal, and unbiased and impartial justice under the constitutional rule of law. That's for everybody in this room, everybody in this country. We share the dream of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He was great. What a speech. Where is she? Where's my beautiful? It is. Oh, I want to be able to see you. I wish I'd turn off those lights. I want. But you are so amazing and we've been friends so long. But we share those dreams of a nation where we are all treated equally because we're all created equal with equal rights and equal dignity in the eyes of God. And we love God. Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists, communists, and fascists indict me, I consider it a great, great badge of honor because I'm being indicted for you, the American people. I'm being indicted for you, the black population. I am being indicted for a lot of different groups by sick people. These are sick, sick people. Never forget our enemies want to take away my freedom because I will never let them take away your freedom. It's very simple. They want to silence me because I will never let them silence you. And in the end, they're not after me, they're after you. And I'm just standing in their way. I just happen to be standing in their way from the very first day that we take back the White House. And it's going to be we are going to take back something. Me. This is the greatest Make America Great Again. When Biden gets up and says, we're going to stop Make America Great, I say, the guy doesn't even know what the hell it meant. If I said, Joe, what does MAGA mean? I don't know. Please tell me. I'd love to know. Make America Great Again. But right from the beginning, we take away our beautiful, cherished White House from crooked Joe Biden. I believe we're going to have the four greatest years in the history of our country and the four greatest years for the black population. It will inure to your benefit, just as it did in my first four years. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, shortly after we win the presidency, I will have the horrible war between Russia and Ukraine settled and restore peace through strength. Just like when I did the wine and just like I did with the soldiers, we will have peace. We will have peace. We're not going to let that go on. People are being brutally killed by the hundreds of thousands. The numbers are far greater than they report. We're going to rebuild our cities into beacons of hope and safety and beauty better than they have ever been before. We'll work with Democrat mayors and Democrat governors if we have to, but we're all controlled by the Democrats. But we will go in and we will straighten our cities out and we'll get rid of the crime. We will take over the horribly run capital of our nation in Washington, D.C., and clean up, renovate, and rebuild our capital city so it is no longer a nightmare of murder and crime, but rather it will become the most beautiful capital anywhere in the world. We will clean it up and we will make it safe and we will fix the roads, which have potholes and filth and garbage and the medians which have fallen into the roads. And I just wonder what foreign countries, what leaders of foreign countries think as they come into the Washington, D.C., and they see the deplorable graffiti all over the beautiful white marble columns. I will always defend Medicare and Social Security, which, as you know, Nikki is not doing a good job on that. You know, we sort of don't even talk about her anymore. It's amazing when you do badly in the polls how you don't mention people, isn't it? It's an amazing phenomena. I hope you <laughs> neocon. I hope I hope you remember that tomorrow, but I will support our because we have to get out our vote. We have to send the signal for November. We have to get out and vote. We have to win by big margins in Iowa. As I said, I got the largest margin in history by double. And New Hampshire, the same thing. We had the most votes in history, more than John F. Kennedy. Think of it. He's right next door. We got many more, thousands and thousands of votes more than John F. Kennedy. That's a great honor. 
I will support our community churches, and we will put faith and family at the center of American life. And that's a huge thing for the black community. I will fight for universal school choice so that every parent has the power to send their child to the private, public, charter, or religious school that is best for their child. I will get politics out of our classroom and focus our schools on the skills of our children. We want them to be able to graduate from school and succeed and get a great, great job. There are jobs that they're well suited to, but they don't teach that in those particular schools. I think that vocational schools are really lacking in this country. You have people, and they can make more money. They can make more money that way than they're going to make by sitting in some cubicle doing numbers, which they might not be good at, but they may be really great at the other kinds of skills. And I will keep men out of women's sports, if that's okay with you. I will fully uphold the Second Amendment, and unlike Democrats, I will not disarm law-abiding citizens while leaving guns in the hands of violent criminals. We will protect innocent life and restore free speech, and I will secure our elections like never before. Our goal will be one day voting with paper ballots and voter ID, right? Voter ID. Paper ballots. You know, it'll cost about 9%. I don't know if you know that. Uh, with all the millions and millions they spend, and it's still really messed up, it will cost to have great, secure elections, 9% the cost of doing it the way we're doing it now. It's a scam. But until then, Republicans have to win. We just have to win. If you took the 10 worst presidents in the history of the United States and added them up, they would not have done near the destruction and harm to our country as Joe Biden and the Biden administration has done. He's the worst president in history. And I, I'm telling you, and I told you before, I would never be this harsh I'd say, well, he's got some difficulty now. Once I got indicted, I said, wow, that's horrible. Nobody thought that was going to happen. Even the super liberal pundits said, well, they'd never indict a popular president. I got the most votes of any sitting president in history by far. So I guess that makes me popular. I watch some of these shows and they say, well, he's not popular. I said, I think I'm really popular. I have a 92% rating of the Republican Party. If I endorse somebody, it almost guarantees they're going to win. And I got to listen to these fake news people say, they usually tie me in with Biden. They usually say, these are two unpopular people. I don't think I'm unpopular, really. <laughs> then they say, women don't like him. I think women like me. I think I've, owned, I've never had a problem. Never had a big problem. So if you want to save America, then South Carolina tomorrow, you must go out and vote. You have to do it. And in conclusion, every generation, black patriots in this state, this great state, I love this state, we've won it every time, primaries and general elections, and all across our nation have poured out their blood, sweat, and tears for our country. Black patriots fought and bled on the battlefields of the American Revolution. And they really did, when you read the history, what they gave up. They gave everything to smash the chains of slavery and preserve our nation. And they did it with incredible bravery. They helped win the Wild West, tame the skies, and save freedom in the Second World War. They're warriors. From the very beginning, black Americans have been a vital part of the American story, helping to make this the greatest nation in the history of the world. So true. Thank you. We thank you. We thank you for it. But now we are a nation in decline. We are a failing nation. We are a nation that has lost its confidence, its willpower, and its strength. We are a nation that has lost its way. But we are not going to allow this horror to continue. Three years ago, we were a great nation, and we will soon be a great nation again. We have to be. We have to be. It was hardworking patriots like you who built this country, and it is hardworking patriots like you who are going to save our country. We will fight for America like no one has ever fought before. 2024 is our final battle. With you at my side, black Americans. Again, nobody has ever seen poll numbers like this. 
If we could guarantee this for nine months, we could, do you see this? All my friends right here, you're going to be in that position that you're looking for in California, too. I predict, I predict you're doing great. But all of these incredible people, all of these people, they're so great. If we could come in just at the numbers we have now, there's no way we can be defeated. We have to come in. We have to win because we're going to lose our nation. We will demolish the deep state. We'll expel the warmongers, these stupid, crazy warmongers from our government. They want to go out and kill everybody. They don't understand. They want to kill everybody for no reason whatsoever. Countries that don't want us, countries that have people. They're dying all over the place. We're dropping bombs all over the Middle East again. Here we go with stupid people dropping bombs. We'll drive out the globalists. We'll cast out the communists, Marxists, and fascists. We'll throw off the sick political class that hates our country. They absolutely hate our country. And we will evict crooked Joe Biden from the White House on November 5th, 2024. He's been very bad to you. He's been very, very bad to you. The great silent majority is rising like never before. And under our leadership, the forgotten men and women will be forgotten no longer. They will be forgotten no longer. They weren't forgotten during that four-year period. It was a glorious period for our nation. Again, the best job numbers from every single group, women, men, people with beautiful, beautiful diplomas from MIT, Harvard, from the Wharton School of Finance, the greatest, people with no diploma from high school, every single group, was doing better than they had ever done before. We're a movement, and it's a big movement. It's the biggest movement in the history of our country. Make America great again, MAGA. It's, it's, and, and you are going to be the biggest part of it. I believe you could be the biggest part of it. We are one movement, one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. And together, we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. Thank you very much, everybody. We love you all. God bless you all. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, wraps up not only day two at CPAC, but also another speech in uh, South Carolina for President Trump. Absolutely. Again, it's the eve of the South Carolina primary. Tomorrow is the day. Uh, we've been eager to see what happens in South Carolina. Voters get out and vote. We want to see a record turnout uh, tomorrow in the South Carolina primary. Excited about it, Brian. That's right. We'll be on the ground with President Trump, so tune in. Uh, keep up with our social media for exact times on that. We do want to thank our partners for today's broadcast. That is the Birch Gold Group. And once again, if you want to invest in gold, silver, and precious metals, just simply text the words Trump to 989898 to get that free information gold kit. You can even uh, transition from a traditional IRA into a gold-backed IRA. It's real easy to do. There's little cost uh, at all, if any, involved in all of this. So uh, check out our friends over the Birch Gold Group and text the words Trump to 989898. And you know what? It's better than drinking purified water, breathing purified air. I and we've agree got with you. Yes. a great new partner for today's broadcast, and the information for that is on your screen. If you've got pets in your house, you've got dust.
or any type of mold, things like that. It can purify the air, breathe clean air. When you breathe clean air, you feel healthier. And that's exactly what they do. So go check it out. It doesn't matter the size of your house. And get this, the filter never needs to be replaced. Air, water, healing. It just sounds nice. It does sound nice. Yes. And they're uh, first time uh, with the with the uh, network, so we'll make sure that we uh, go check them out as well. Tax Network USA, it is tax season. So if you have any questions about your taxes, if you are struggling with back taxes, no matter what issues you may face or what questions you may have, contact the experts at Tax Network USA. The information there also on your screen, tnusa.com. Check out that 1-800 number as well. Uh, those uh, experts are standing by waiting for you. They want to help you. They want to ease some of that relief or that stress that you may have, give you some relief as we uh, head into the, to the deadline. You know, a lot of people have to file extensions, but these people will do it for you so yeah. you don't have to worry about it. That's the great part. That's what I do, Brian. Just hand it to someone else. And that's what they want. They are uh, certified in every single state, so no matter where you live in America, they can help you out. So make sure you give Tax Network USA a call or log on to their website, tnusa.com. Also, free Trump book. Yeah, I was going to say, let's not forget about those guys, freetrumpbook.com. Uh, what a great way to share the accomplishments of President Trump to the world. Uh, it's easy to read. You can read along with little Marty. You can look at the pictures with little Marty. He can like point at President <laughs> Hi, little Trump. Marty. Hey, little Probably Marty. Up watching right now. He, he shouldn't. He should be in bed. <laughs> uh, but you know, freetrumpbook.com. You got to pay a shipping and handling fee on that. And uh, but why not get one for your friend, your neighbor, your school, your church? Go check it out. Freetrumpbook.com. By the awesome. way, does and does Marty stay up late? He does. You need to get that kid to bed. I know. But you know what? On the nights that he has Mother's Day out, I put him to bed early. Okay. On the other nights, he stays up. We've got to find out when Gage puts his son to bed. Yeah. If All the moms at home day. don't get mad at me. It's just what we do. I went we to bed it. early when I was a kid. Yeah. Well, we stayed up late at my house, yeah. but, you know, we're night That's owls, why I'm falling so. asleep right now. <laughs> so we're going to wrap this up quick. <laughs> don't forget to donate to RSBN. Thank you to all the donors who have this from day one, continuing to give us any type of donation, whether it's $1, $100, whatever the case may be. Thank you. Continue to do so because it's because of you we're able to travel across the country and bring america the truth so thank you to our donors go to rsbnetwork.com donate if you can and while you're there sign up for our newsletter which is awesome uh, we have a staff that writes wonderful stories about what's going on in the news the truth about what's going on in america you can get all of that on our rsbn newsletter there you go if you donate ten thousand dollars tonight right now i will broadcast from your house oh okay and that's that's and don't forget to buy the, the gold hat as well. We have that all up on the website. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, once again uh, for day two at CPAC and also wrapping up uh, the, the Trump speech there in South Carolina. We are live on the ground in South Carolina. We're live on the ground here in CPAC and we've got another day uh, ahead of you uh, for that. So uh, for Vanessa Broussard, Brian Glenn and the whole gang here, we say so long, so long everybody from our nation's capital. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless. The Plug-In Mini Air Purifier is the greatest air purifier for bathroom odors or for kitty litter. If you're sick of smelling like the crazy cat lady, plug it in. The Mini Air is the most versatile air purifier plug-in on the market. Not only does it remove odors, whether it's human odors, kitty litter, it is absolutely incredible. You just click it, walk away, you've got a clean, fresh room. Oh, hey guys, fancy seeing you here. I just got done taking a massive hit. A hit? Yes, what do you do for the hit odors in your bathroom? We're gonna answer the age old question. Does a bear take a hit in the woods? Have you ever been up Hits Creek without a paddle? Let me show you how one finger can click one button and hit gone.
Looks like you've been sleeping well. Megan, he's back. The my pillow guy. And you're looking good. He's still feeling good. Well, just when you thought it couldn't get any better, we've got the best pillow ever, my pillow 2.0. <gasps> When I invented my pillow, it had everything you'd ever want in a pillow. Well, now there's new technology that makes it even better. My Pillow 2.0 has my patented fill combined with a cooling fabric with temperature regulating thread. My Pillow 2.0 is truly the next generation of my pillow. Now's the time to go to mypillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use the promo code to save 50% on your My Pillow 2.0. Not only for a limber ships Free. Sleeping even better. And cooler, too. And you're looking good. Feeling, Feeling good. good. I knew you would. MyPillow.com uh, Philip Patrick. This is where we drill it down. What can they do to ensure that they don't get tangled up in this cobweb uh, and they can secure their financial what Burt's Gold Group specialize in precious metals in climates like this. They work very well to protect against the reality. These things all drive gold and silver up. So it works as a very the realities of Bidenomics. So I would encourage everyone to get educated, start reading. I think it's very simple. We got to text Trump to...